Good evening. So today I have uh, have something special, and um, it's from uh, Arthur Jensen, uh, actually himself, uh, via a trans uh, a tape from Helmut Nyberg, and um, it concerns the uh, the Harvard Educational Review 1969 debate. And uh, for those unfamiliar, it was uh, a debate uh, where uh, Arthur Jensen was invited to submit this 120-page article reviewing his findings and uh, reviewing the findings on intelligence research, behavioral genetics, and so on, as, as the field was in 1969. And um, it, uh, the, there was a lot of replies to this uh, his article. He, it was a target article, right? So other academics, are uh, they submit their like criticism of it or uh, agreements or this sort of thing. And so the, it's caused a massive uh, like a PR uh, Problem or PR campaign against him, and there was, you know, death, uh, yeah, bomb threats, and he had to have uh, civilian guards following him around campus and so on. So in many ways, uh, this uh, 69 debate see is kind of similar to the current uh, communist sort of uprising that we have uh, had uh, the the great awakening in the West for uh, last five years or so. And uh, what's very interesting about this, um, you can read uh, Jensen's own memoirs about this in his 1972 book, Genetics and Education, which actually just is a compilation of his articles, but except for the uh, the introduction or the preface, uh, which is supposed to be short, but it's like 70 pages. And um, if we go here to the page 52, we can read that uh, during these uh, demonstrations, he was put in a telephone contact with an undercover person uh, who was actually infiltrating the Marxists. So it's the other way around. Instead of the Marxists infiltrating the government uh, here, they're infiltrating the student uh, radicals. And so this person was uh, somehow an insider in these like uh, radical Marxist circles. And they had the, the, the Marxists, they had this uh, idea is that what they want to do is that they wanted to have Jensen come to some public debate that was kind of open and then they could do the whole, you know, boohoo uh, harassment sort of thing that people do nowadays also against, uh, you know, uh, Charles Murray and, and, and so on, these kind of people. Um, and so it's been a kind of standard of practice, but because Jensen knew about this, uh, he took, uh, he made a counter offer and he, he said that he would not participate in this uh, sort of affair. He would have a, a small venue with only about 50 people uh, attending. And so they couldn't do the whole scream tactic and bring in 500 people with the, you know, uh, sound horns and this sort of thing. And it had to be really recorded so they can't lie about what exactly was said after. And so for the, um, and so the, the sociologist people, of course, um, they, they did not like this at all. Um, they, they hated it, right? Um, they wanted the big hall so they could do their student thing exactly as the insider told them. But then the university didn't want to pay unless Jensen was there. And so it came to be that this debate between academics was held uh, in 69 and with Jensen, uh, you know, coming under criticism for these various other academics and then, you know, replying to them. And there was even like some, some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, what's very interesting about this, uh, this debate um, is that it actually foreshadows a lot of the early, later debates that would, uh, that would happen on this topic of race and intelligence and gaps and, and, and these things. And uh, in particular, worth noting in this is that uh, there are actually people arguing in 69 already that uh, the Flynn effect, before it was called the Flynn effect, um, the Flynn effect was only named in uh, 1994 in the bell curve by you know, Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein. And, uh, but actually, it was these IQ secular gains uh, were related, they were known even back in the 60s, and many people don't know that. And so it's, it's totally incorrect to say that Flynn discovered the Flynn effect. He's actually, he just popularized it and uh, it was well known before him. Um, so people back in the 60s, they were saying that uh, Look at the data from the First World War and the Second World War. On the same test, you can see there's a large uh, increase in in observed uh, in the, the raw scores, and so intelligence seems to be going up. While the the family evidence of dysgenics, like uh, dominant people have more kids, the the IQ should going down. So what's what's going on here, right? Uh, why does the why does the measurement seem to go up while the genetics should be going down? It's it's kind of a it's conundrum, right? It's kind of the Flynn's paradox or whatever they call this. Um, and um, so they also use this to, so they say that uh, the, the secular gains in IQ must be environmental. And uh, therefore also, if you have gaps between groups at a given time, they could also be environmental. So it's kind of a, it's, 
it's not a direct argument saying that the race gaps is environmental. It's, it's just kind of in trying to increase the prior. Uh, because if you can show that other groups, some of them at least have purely environmental or overwhelmingly environmental causes, then maybe maybe the black one, uh, the black white uh, gap could also have that or the, uh, the white uh, Hispanic gap or something. Anyway, so that's just one example. And uh, if you pause the video and look here, you can see the participants, which are basically, uh, I think, mostly local professors at Berkeley at the time, and uh, some of them quite famous. I think uh, Kurt Stern here, who was the uh, the chairman, I think he, he won a Nobel Prize, uh, uh, maybe already at the time or maybe only later. Um, so enjoy. This meeting has been called to deal with an issue not with a person. Issues are raised by persons, and it is easy to confuse one with the other. Nearly by, by definition, issues are unresolved problems, or at least problems which have not been solved in the same way in the minds of different persons or groups of persons. The problem of the role that hereditary and non-hereditary agents play in the observed variation of mental attributes within a group, group of subjects is such an issue. Large areas of agreement exist in the nature-nurture issue, but areas of disagreement remain. The problem of heredity and environment in mental attributes is a sensitive one in a sociological sense. It is sensitive when one considers its aspects within a single racial group, such as Caucasians, since it involves differences of socioeconomic subpopulations. It is even more sensitive when one considers and compares different racial groups, such as American whites and American blacks. Some people advise us to stay away from such sensitive problems that are liable to lead to emotional explosions. Other people feel that prejudice will persist if we do not attempt to consider such problems in the spirit of rational inquiry. Our answers may only be approximations, or they may even turn out to be mistaken. More significantly still, our answers may say, we do not know, yet. Complex questions do not yield easily to simple answers, but it is better to try than to hide away. If there is to be relevancy, and there should be, let it be relevancy with an open mind. Our meeting took its origin from an article in the Harvard Educational Review by Arthur R. Jensen, professor of education at Berkeley, entitled, How much can we boost IQ and scholastic achievement? This article has provoked nationwide discussions. Our meeting is devoted to a detailed analysis by a variety of experts of the article and the problem it raises. It is sponsored by the Chancellor's Office, the Department of Sociology, the School of Education, and University Extension, Berkeley. I would like now to introduce the individuals uh, sitting around this table. Uh, to the left is Professor Arthur Jensen, Professor of Education in Berkeley. Next to him, Professor Aaron Sikorel, Professor of Sociology, University of California, Santa Barbara. Next is Dr. Joshua Lederberg, Professor of Genetics at Stanford University. I am Kurt Stern, Professor of Zoology and Genetics, Berkeley. Next to me on the right is Professor Arthur Stinchcombe, Professor of Sociology in Berkeley. Next to him, Professor William Libby, Associate Professor of Genetics at Berkeley. And at the right, uh, Dr. Lee Kronberg, Professor of Education at Stanford University. We will begin with a summary of research and position by Professor Jensen, which then will be followed by a number of the <coughs> commenting crit uh, uh, critical individuals to be interrupted by a certain counter comments by Dr. Jensen and then followed once more with a number of critiques. And after that, there will be an open discussion from the audience. Dr. Jensen. Uh, thank you, Professor Stern. More than one year ago, the Board of Editors of the Harvard Educational Review solicited me to write an article for their winter 1969 issue on the general topic, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? 
Their letter of solicitation outlined the main points to be discussed in the article, with particular reference to the contribution of heredity and environment to intelligence and scholastic performance, an evaluation of efforts to raise IQ and scholastic performance of disadvantaged children, my position on social class and racial differences in intelligence, and my own research on the triple interaction among the variables intelligence, associative learning, and socioeconomic status. The resulting article of 123 pages, the longest ever published by the Harvard Educational Review, discussed each of these topics in considerable detail. I will now indicate briefly the gist of what I said on each topic. Compensatory education. First, I reviewed the conclusions of a nationwide survey and evaluation of the large federally funded compensatory education programs, an evaluation by the United States Commission on Civil Rights, which concluded that these special programs had produced no significant improvement in the measured intelligence or scholastic performance of the disadvantaged children whose educational achievements these programs were specifically intended to raise. The evidence presented by the U.S. Commission suggests to me that merely applying more of the same approach to compensatory education on a larger scale is not likely to lead to the desired results, namely increasing the benefits of public education to the disadvantaged. The well-documented fruitlessness of these well-intentioned large-scale compensatory programs indicate the importance of now questioning the assumptions, theories, and practices on which they were based. I point out also that some small-scale experimental intervention programs have shown more promise of beneficial results. I do not advocate abandoning efforts to improve the education of the disadvantaged. I urge increased emphasis on these efforts in the spirit of experimentation, expanding the diversity of approaches, and improving the rigor of evaluation in order to boost our chances of discovering the methods that will work best. The nature of intelligence. <clears throat> I point out that IQ tests evolved to predict scholastic performance in largely European and North American middle class populations around the turn of the century. They evolved to measure those particular abilities most relevant to a particular curriculum and type of instruction, which in turn were shaped by the particular pattern of abilities of the children the schools were then intended to serve. IQ, or abstract reasoning ability, is thus a selection of just one portion of the total spectrum of human mental abilities. This aspect of mental abilities measured by IQ tests is important in our society, but is not the only set of educationally or occupationally relevant abilities by any means. The other mental abilities we know of have not yet been adequately measured. Their distributions in various segments of the population have not been adequately determined and their educational relevance has not been fully explored. I believe a much broader assessment of the spectrum of abilities and potentials and the investigation of their utilization for educational achievement will be an essential aspect of improving the education of children called disadvantaged. The inheritance of intelligence. Much of my paper is a review of the methods and uh, evidence that lead me to the conclusion that individual differences in intelligence, that is IQ, are predominantly attributable to genetic differences with environmental factors contributing a minor portion of the variance among individuals in IQ. The heritability of the IQ, that is, the percentage of individual differences variance attributable to genetic factors, comes out to about 80% which is the average value obtained in all the relevant studies now reported in the literature, with values extending over a range from about 60% to 90%. These estimates of heritability are based on tests administered to European and North American populations and cannot properly be generalized to other populations. I believe we need similar heritability studies in minority populations if we are to increase our understanding of what our tests measure in these populations and how these abilities can be most effectively used in the educational process. Social class differences. Although the full range of IQ and other abilities is found among children in every socioeconomic stratum in our population, it is well established 
that the IQ differs on the average among children from different social class backgrounds. The evidence, some of which I refer to in my article, indicates to me that some of this IQ difference is, an, is attributable to environmental differences, and some of it is attributable to genetic differences between social classes, largely as a result of differential selection of the parent generations for different patterns of ability. I have not yet met or read a modern geneticist who disputes this interpretation of the evidence. The geneticist C.O. Carter remarked, sociologists who doubt this show more ingenuity than judgment. I have also read at least three prominent sociologists who are students of this problem, Sorokin, Bruce Eklund, and Otis Dudley Duncan, and all agree that selective factors in social mobility and assortative mating have resulted in a genetic component in social class intelligence differences. As Eklund points out, however, this conclusion holds within socially defined racial groups but cannot properly be generalized between racial groups since barriers to upward social mobility have undoubtedly been quite different for various racial groups. <clears throat> Race differences. I have always advocated dealing with persons as individuals, each in terms of his own merits and characteristics. I am opposed to according any treatment to persons solely on the basis of their race, color, national origin, or social class background. But I am also opposed to ignoring or refusing to investigate the causes of the well-established differences among racial groups in the distribution of educationally relevant traits, particularly IQ. <clears throat> I believe that the causes of the observed differences in IQ and scholastic performance among different ethnic groups is scientifically still an open question, an important question, and a researchable question. I believe that official statements, apparently accepted without question by some social scientists, such as, quote, it is a demonstrable fact that the talent pool in any one ethnic group is substantially the same as in any other ethnic group, unquote, U.S. Office of Education, 1966, and, quote, intelligence potential is distributed among Negro infants in the same proportion and pattern as among Icelanders or Chinese or any other group, unquote, Department of Labor, 1965, are without scientific merit. They lack any factual basis and must be regarded only as hypotheses. It would require more time than I'm allotted to tell you of the personal and professional consequences of challenging this prevailing hypothesis of genetic equality by suggesting alternative hypotheses that invoke genetic as well as environmental factors as being among the causes of the observed differences in patterns of mental ability among racial groups. The fact that different racial groups in this country have widely separated geographic origins and have had quite different histories which have subjected them to different selective social and economic pressures make it highly likely that their gene pools differ for some genetically conditioned behavioral characteristics, intelligence or abstract reasoning ability among them. Nearly every anatomical, physiological, and biochemical system investigated shows racial differences. Why should the brain be an exception? The reasonableness of the hypothesis that there are racial differences in genetically conditioned behavioral characteristics, including mental abilities, is not confined to the poorly informed, but has been expressed in writings and public statements by such eminent geneticists as K. Mather, C. D. Darlington, R. A. Fisher, and Francis Crick, to name but a few. I indicated several lines of evidence which support my assertion that a genetic hypothesis is not unwarranted. The fact that we still have only inconclusive conclusions with respect to this hypothesis does not mean that the opposite of the hypothesis is true. Yet some social scientists speak of this as if this were the case and have even publicly censured me for suggesting an alternative to purely environmental hypotheses of intelligence differences. Scientific investigation proceeds most effectively by means of what Platt has called strong inference, which means pitting against one another alternative hypotheses that lead to different predictions. Dysgenic trends. More important than the issue of racial differences per se is the probability, explicated in my article, 
of diff uh, dysgenic trends in our urban slums, as suggested by census data showing markedly higher birth rates among the poorest segments of the Negro population than among successful middle-class Negroes. This social class differential in birth rate appears much greater in the Negro than in the white population. That is, the least able among Negroes have a higher reproductive rate than their white counterparts in ability, and the educationally and occupationally most able segment of the Negro population has a lower reproductive rate than their white counterparts. If social class intelligence differences within the Negro population have a genetic component, as in the white population, the condition I have described could create and widen the genetic intelligence difference between Negroes and whites. The social and educational implications of this trend, if it exists and persists, are enormous. The problem obviously deserves thorough investigation by social scientists and geneticists. The problem should not be ignored or superficially dismissed out of motives of well-meaning wishful thinking. The possible consequences of our failure seriously to study these questions may well be viewed by future generations as our society's greatest injustice to Negro Americans. The last part of my paper deals with my theory of two broad categories of mental abilities which I call intelligence or abstract reasoning ability and associative learning ability. These types of ability appear to be distributed differently in various social classes and racial groups. While large racial and social class differences are found for intelligence, there are practically negligible differences among these groups in associative learning abilities such as memory span and serial and paired associate rote learning. Research should be directed at delineating still other types of abilities and at discovering how the particular strengths in each individual's pattern of abilities can be most effectively brought to bear on school learning and on the attainment of occupational skills. By pursuing this path, I believe that we can discover the means by which the reality of individual differences need not mean educational rewards for some children and utter frustration and defeat for others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jensen, for the statement of your position. Uh, the first uh, person who wants to comment critically on you is Professor Stinchcomb. Next to me. Um. Uh, I will try to be ingenious, but uh, to show uh, judgment, nevertheless. Uh, I'd like to present some uh, criticisms of Jensen's use of his evidence. Uh, this implies that I'll have to stay within his theoretical framework, his definition of intelligence, his notion of the basic nature of the cognitive environment of the individual, and so forth. I think there are things basically wrong with Jensen's uh, theoretical approach to the whole business, but I, I will leave those aside. Uh, Jensen's argument depends on statistical evidence, which means that I'll have to give something of a statistical critique. I'll try to do it as intuitively as I can, but, uh, but I'm afraid it's liable to be uh, in places somewhat technical. Briefly, my conclusion is that Jensen's evidence does not show anything at all about racial differences in intelligence except for some weak evidence that American Indians may be genetically superior to everybody else. Uh, the most impressive argument for the heritability of intelligence in Jensen's piece, and hence indirectly for genetic component in racial differences, is clearly the data on correlations among kinsmen in IQ. The basic finding in this research is that if you take pairs of kinsmen that are genetically more closely related, for instance, identical twins, and pairs of kinsmen that are farther apart, for instance, paternal twins, then the relation between the IQs of the closer pairs will be greater than the correlation between the IQs of the more distant pairs. That is, if you know the IQ of one identical twin, you can predict the IQ of the other very well. If you know the IQ of a fraternal twin, you can't predict the IQ of the other fraternal twin nearly as well. By combining genetic theory about the differences in genetic closeness of different types of relatives with knowledge of the differences in correlations between pairs of different types of relatives, one can estimate how much effect genetic closeness has. From this estimate of the effect of genetic closeness, one can estimate the size of the effect of a man's genetic constitution on, on, on the behavioral capacities that he manifests. 
even though one can't measure the genetic constitution itself. But if we look at Jensen's own estimates of environmental effects for IQ, which appear on page 51 of the original article, we find that the difference in environment between one twin and another is the same size as the difference in environment between one family and another. That is, in the samples of, uh, uh, from which uh, Mr. Jensen's evidence comes, if you pick out two brothers at random, the chances that one of the brothers will be in a deprived environment while the other's in an advantaged environment is the same as the chance that, that one out of a pair of randomly picked families is a deprived environment while the other's advantaged. To suggest that differences in environment between the races are about the same size as differences in environment between two identical twins, as would be implied by using Jensen's estimates of heritability for uh, the differences between races, seems to me rather an out, out, outrageous hypothesis. This peculiar fact in Jensen's data of as much environmental variation within families as between families is illuminated if we look at the samples from which the data come. The one described for London in his article is more or less typical. And I have to summarize very briefly what, what I think is going on here. That briefly, if you and your cousin both live in London and are both still in school and hence appear in the sample, then the difference between your father's family and your uncle's family is about of the same order of magnitude as the difference between your family as you grew up in it and your family as your brother grew up in it. That is, the environmental variations we're talking about and, and which this uh, d data uh, it, uh, uh, is about are variations within a group which intermarries among itself and exchange children by adoption. If we want to generalize across these intermarrying groups, for instance, across races, we have to ask whether there's more variation in the environment between a white and Negro family than there is among kinfolk living in London. If there is, then the between families variation in environmental factors would increase over what, uh, over what uh, is shown in Jensen's data, and the relative role of genetic factors would decrease. Also, the relative role of within family variation in environment would decrease as compared to the between family variation in environment. As it stands now, we know that in all probability, any difference in IQ between you and your cousin is most probably genetic, provided he lives in the same metropolis with you and is still in school. That is, Jensen's evidence seems to me to be completely irrelevant to the, uh, uh, his kinship evidence seems to me to be completely irrelevant to the question of racial differences in genetic constitution. Another uh, imp apparently impressive piece of evidence is the lar what's called the larger regression effect for Negroes uh, as opposed to whites. Briefly, the data are the IQs of children subtracted from the, the IQs of the parents in each of three, four, or five social classes. The difference between talented parents and their children are larger for Negro middle class children than for white middle class children. Jensen's argument here goes as follows. The difference between children's and parents' IQs measures the difference between the set of genes that are manifested in the parents and the selection from that set which the parent transmits to his children. That is, out of the total pool, pool of genes that the parent carries, only one subset are the ones that are transmitted. The transmitted subset will be more nearly a random sample from the pool of genes than the full set that a talented parent manifests. If the pool is a lot different from the genes that the parent manifests, then the children will be a lot different from their parents. So the size of the difference between parents and children is supposed to measure the distance for the parents between the genes that they manifest and the genes that they transmit without manifesting. So if Negroes of high intelligence show more regression effect than whites of the same intelligence and environment, that's supposed to show that the pool of genes from which exceptionally talented Negroes come is farther from them on the average than the pool from which exceptionally talented white comes, whites come. Uh, now, the key to this inference of Jensen's is actually equating the environments of the children. For if children of talented Negroes are actually exposed to a poorer environment than our whites, 
even though they're in the same social class as measured, then we'd expect a larger regression effect, even if the pool of genes were the same distance from the parents. What we have to do then is to examine the equation of parent status first, and then the question of whether the equation of status equates environments. Briefly, my argument will be that Jensen has not in fact equated statuses, and that if he, even if he had, he wouldn't have equated environments. First, let's assume that the indicator of status, the measure of the social class of people in the studies that Jensen quotes, let's assume that that were a perfect measure of status. Then what he's done is to pick out three uh, or four or five cutting points on this uh, variable of, uh, of people's status and equated all people above the top cutting point as middle class and so forth. As Jensen carefully shows for IQ, if one distribution has a lower mean than the other, and the distributions have the same shape, then the more extreme values are more underrepresented in the lower distribution than the more moderate values. The same is true as of status. There aren't Negro, Rockefellers, Mellons, and DuPonts. The, those kind of people are more underrepresented among Negroes than our $20,000 a year men. $20,000 a year men are more underrepresented than $10,000 a year men, and so forth. So if you take a given cutoff point for the middle class, those few Negroes that are middle class will mostly be very near that cutoff. Many of the whites will be quite far from the cutoff, quite uh, rich and well-educated and so forth. Thus, actually, the mean class position for middle class Negroes is likely to be much lower than the mean class position of middle class whites. Even if the class measures were perfect, the groups wouldn't be equated, that is. But the actual situation is that the measurement of social status is much more unreliable, uh, which is presumably the fault of sociologists, than the measurement of IQ. And Jensen's always a careful to take account of measurement error of IQ. Merely to take occupation in, at an, as an example, at a given point in time, when the census re-interviews people about their occupations immediately after having interviewed them, they get 17 to 22 percent of the people giving a different occupation. The reliability of an occupational scale is about uh, 0.86 for whites and 0.81 for Negroes. Uh, uh, this is using trained census uh, interviewers who know what's required to classify an occupation. Most school studies ask children to describe their parents' occupation, which is even more uh, full of uh, error. Furthermore, the environment of a child is a, is a cumulative matter consisting of so-and-so many months in a middle-class family when his father had a good job, so-and-so many months in a welfare family when he was out of work, and so forth. So even if we had a perfect measure of the status of the family at a given time, it might very well be, it would be, in fact, a poor measure of the cumulative environment of a child uh, because people's status changes a good deal over their lives. Uh, we have various estimates of the amount of instability of occupational status uh, in a form similar to the estimates uh, Jensen gives for IQ. I think the one that's most relevant is the correlation between first job and present job for young men, which is only about 0.58 uh, in a census study of this question. That is, there's a great deal of instability in people's class position. People's class position is not a permanent characteristic of them. Uh, and it's especially unstable precisely during the years when they're having children. Therefore, th that is during their young years. Therefore, the measure of a person's status at some particular point in time will be a poor measure of the cumulative environment which a child has experienced at home. Well, uh, what this does in th to the uh, regression problem is that the regression effects works the same way uh, with measurement error as it works with genetic variation. That is, uh, if, if you have, a, for instance, a distribution of 10%, uh, of uh, uh, the true distribution is 10% of Negroes are middle class and 90% are working class, whereas the whites divide 50-50. And if you apply a, a measuring instrument that misclassifies, say, only 10% of all the people, then half of all of the Negroes who are who are, you call middle class will be truly working class, whereas only 10% of all the whites that you measure as, as middle class will be truly working class. Uh, 
on, on all of these grounds, then, it seems to me that the different regression effects cannot be taken as evidence that talented Negroes are farther genetically from their gene pools than our talented whites. Now to uh, the last uh, part of, of, of the, the critique that I want to give of Jensen's evidence. Uh, I'd like to address the question of how big is a big environmental effect. Jensen's argument rests on a, a set of judgments that the effects that he finds, that studies of environmental impact find, are small. Uh, the difficulty that, uh, that the, the difficulty that I mentioned before about environment being cumulative shows up again in the evaluation of the size of environmental effects. Jensen would like to have environments change once and for all from one environment to another, as genes do, and then stay that way. Environmental change in this conception comes in a spurt. Any time after that, we can measure the effects of the spurt. Genetic variation comes that way, environmental does not. The difference between Negro and white measured IQ scores in the United States is about one standard deviation, or 15 IQ points. We can take this as a measure of the size of the uh, effect that we have to uh, look for. Jensen observes that by decreasing the fear people have in the testing situation so that they feel they control the situation and can keep from getting hurt, one can often increase poor children's IQ by five points, or about a third of the distance between whites and Negroes. This seems to him to be evidence of a small environmental effect, since most other changes in environments only produce about the same effect. But if he regarded it as changing the environment, to take the fear out of the testing situation, he would conclude that by taking the fear out of the relations between Negroes and whites, Negroes and their environment, this might by itself decrease the difference uh, between Negro and white performance by a third. Then Jensen goes through a set of educational studies which show that by changing the environment of children for six or nine or three months, one can change their IQs by five to 10 points. That is, a short period of environmental enrichment can apparently wipe out a third to two-thirds of the difference between whites and Negroes. This is a change in only 20 to 25 hours a week of their environment. Finally, we quite often find that naturally occurring variations in environment cause variations of this same order of magnitude in IQ or mental ability sco scores. Uh, we can get a notion of the size of the environmental variation by observing the variation in mental abilities between Negroes whose environment approximates that of whites from those whose environment approximates that of Negroes. Clearly, if Negroes go to nearly all white schools, they're exposed for 30 hours a week to the same environment that most whites uh, are exposed to. If they go to all Negro schools, the 30 hours a week are more like those which most Negroes go to, since most Negroes go to nearly all Negro schools. James Coleman's estimates of the correlation between the proportion white in the school and Negro mental abilities indicates that by changing this part of the child's environment to whites and Negroes for 30 hours a week during the school year, one makes about a half a standard deviation difference. Uh, that is, half of the racial difference can be attributed to 20 or 25 hours a week difference in their environments. Uh, uh, some of Jensen's own evidence gives uh, a notion that, it's a, that the size of environmental effect is approximately, is approximately the same. I won't go through the computations. But one of the most uh, interesting pieces of evidence about the size of the variation that environment can make is the variation between, what, between the results of the testing of draftees in the First World War compared with the testing of draftees in the Second World War, approximately uh, uh, 25 years of history and educational improvement made a difference of approximately one standard deviation, that is approximately the difference between the races, uh, uh, between those, between white people, uh, mostly white people uh, who were tested in the First World War and those who were tested in the Second World War. What we have then is a large number of environmental variables, many of them occupying 
a small part of children's lives that explain between one-third and two-thirds of the difference between the races. If you added them all together, that is, equalized the amount of fear between races, put Negroes in all-white schools or schools with the same conditions, improve the standards of Negro families by a standard deviation, then if the effects are additive, the IQs would be equalized. Jensen thinks that each such variation is small because it only explains half to two-thirds of the racial difference. But environments accumulate. Uh, because Jensen thinks of environment as spurts rather than hours per week, he's surprised when these equalizing spurts don't uh, equalize IQs. In summary, then, I think Jensen's own data on environmental effects in IQ, if he would use them properly, would support an environmental explanation of the differences between races. Thank you, Dr. Stinstrom. There is so much to be said that one would like to have an extra half hour after each individual presentation. But we have to go to Dr. Kronberg, professor of education at Stanford University. I'm going to avoid the nature-nurture arguments that other members of the panel are dealing with and accept Professor Jensen's view that perhaps 80% of individual differences in test performance are inherited. The figure might change as a result of the analysis, but the much more important question is, what does it mean? Let me give you my conclusions and then I'll elaborate as time permits. It is true that Negroes have poorer test performance than whites on the average. Dr. Jensen suggests that this reflects poorer heredity, and I disagree. Dr. Jensen suggests that altering the environment, environment cannot have a worthwhile effect on mental ability, and I disagree. His article recommends that poor children with low IQs be educated by methods that emphasize rote memory. And I disagree. But let us recall one statement he made which is central to all educational planning where there is clear agreement. The full range of human talents is found in every race and every class. Decisions are to be made about individuals in the light of what each one can do, and the challenge is to find strategies for helping each one to develop. That's the central theme in educational planning, and on that I think we all agree. Let me pick up the point that Dr. Stinchcomb was just making, that even within the figure of 80 that Dr. Jensen gives us, environment produces important variation. This chart shows approximately the distribution you would expect on the basis of Jensen's argument, given a range of hereditary factors that make use of environment so that a person grows up able to solve problems on mental tests. Here's your distribution, a strong correlation. The best heredity obviously is leading toward the best test performance. But let's consider a group here perhaps a little above the average in terms of its base. Look at that range. That is the range produced by the fact that this person was luckier in his environment than this one. He drew an environment that his genes could make good use of or poor use of. Now that person is in the highest range of college graduates and that person is at the average of the population. That is a very important difference left for environment within the figure of 80% heritability. Let us look further also at these World War I, World War II data, which actually came from Professor Tuddenham here in this psychology department. Here is the range. If this is today, this is a generation ago. A generation ago, white Americans were poorer in mental test performance. Now, we don't have data going back two or three generations, but if we extrapolate backward, isn't that a remarkable effect for environment in a century? The geneticists will say, of course, that the gene pool has not changed significantly in a century, 
so that if we have had a gain such that the best people a hundred years ago would perform in problem solving like average people today, that is a tremendous effect due to advances in education and child rearing. Now, let's nail this down to the point about Negro. Negro test performance today is represented by that position. They stand in the test distribution exactly where white Americans did in 1917. This sort of argument about 1917 is nicely confirmed by Dr. Bailey's research, nicely confirmed by a new study at the University of Washington. Now, Dr. Jensen would tell you, yes, but that is not the proper conclusion. The proper conclusion is that the Negro distribution is an extension downward of that white distribution so that their hereditary base is poorer than that for white. But there is no evidence to defend that position or this position or this position which would say that the Negro hereditary base was superior. We haven't tested that. But if you raise the question, is the background in which the Negro has developed in the last 10, 20 years poorer than that of the average white in the 1917 period, and I would be inclined to think that it is, then the argument would be in favor of the diagram as I show it here. Another thing about this matter of heredity, it's too easy to think about the IQ as fixed. Let me draw your attention to another set of Berkeley data. These are children studied by Hunzik, McFarlane, and Allen who were born in the city of Berkeley about 1930. We have here records of three individual children. All this zigzag down here says that the very young child is hard to measure and changes a lot from month to month. Compared to the average of this sample, which was followed for nearly 20 years, here is a child who went almost to the bottom of the group by the age of nine and came back up at the age of 18. Here is one who did show about a constant IQ. And here is one who was level enough until about age 10 and then took off. So that if you start thinking about classifying pupils as they come into school, putting each one in the level of education his IQ deserves and leaving him there, you are doing violence to this very important fact of IQ change. Now, if we are to intervene for children who are not very good on our mental tests. We have an enormous job to do because the development of intellect through the genetic potential, working with information, working with emotional experiences so that the child is able to use his mind effectively at school ages is a long, slow, cumulative matter. It is now clear that intellectual growth starts in the cradle continues and is closely tied to personality growth. You have to develop attitudes and motivation as well as concepts and skills. You have to teach self-respect because that leads you to the feeling, I will do better if I persist. I take pride in my work. I enjoy being challenged. That's part of what makes for intellectual development. You must teach the attitude of self-criticism of look before you leap, hold in that impulsiveness. You must teach the attitude that problems can be analyzed, that information can be rearranged, that one has to look for meanings, and that is something a lot of children don't have. You have to teach the idea of using the teacher, paying attention, asking for help. And again, this is something the child from the poor home, the home where the mother is busy, where the mother is not herself a good teacher, doesn't learn that, and therefore he is not ready to perform well, either in the mental test situation or in the school. The school, unfortunately, has tailored its practices to the middle class child who has most of these attitudes, and teachers who take for granted the attitudes I've just listed are not skilled in handling the children who lack them. More than that, of course, the real problem is to develop these attitudes gradually 
and that is something that is going to be very hard for us to do. Let's be clear what we mean by a good environment. A good environment is not merely a wealthy one. It's not merely one with lots of books around. It's an environment that imposes demands and at the same time pre presents emotional support. It's an environment where there is stimulation, but an environment also where there is a lot of clarification. And we are having to try to invent new types of preschool education that meet these specifications. We are also, of course, having to do the much more challenging thing of dealing with young men who need to be educated and who have had 20 years of all these anti-intellectual attitudes. Dr. Jensen's evidence that rote learning ability is something separate from what we usually call intelligence is, I think, sound. There's lots of support from other studies. But I think that it is quite dangerous to propose that this be made the major reliance in education for those who are poor on our tests. This is one kind of learning ability, but the kind of learning ability measured in the IQ is quite important wherever the content to be learned makes sense and the instruction doesn't make everything perfectly clear. Now, if a child is low on that ability, there are three strategies open. We can teach by rote, by a drill and reward type of teaching. Or we can explain things very clearly, by very easy stages, with much nonverbal explanation so that the message will get across even to those who are poor in this intellectual analysis. The third strategy is to work to raise the level two abilities. Now the drill and reward approach is cheap and there are some things you can do with it. And it probably will be important in teaching reading and in teaching arithmetic to get children off to a good start by this method if other methods cannot be put to work. But that method is not flexible. It doesn't promote problem solving. It doesn't promote self-reliance. You can memorize the facts of science, in elementary school science, for example, but you can't, by a drill and reward system, teach the child to criticize scientific arguments. And yet that is the sort of thing that education ought to be concerned with. To limit education to those things that can be handled by rote is to make it not an education, but a training. And I think we cannot have that. It is not enough to say, let us proceed by rote until we bring people up to some level and then go into intellectual education. Dean Brownell of the School of Education here did a famous study in which he went to many schools and tried to teach arithmetic by a meaningful method in which he explained things clearly. These methods are strongly advocated because meaningful learning sticks better and can be used better. But when he tried this in schools where the previous two years' work in arithmetic had been by rote, he was unsuccessful because these third graders didn't know how to listen to explanations, didn't know how to use explanations. Drill instruction is essentially non-intellectual and therefore it stifles the intellect. So that while we undoubtedly will use it for part of the program, it cannot be the full prescription. Now what we can agree on here is that there are probably many different ways of study that children have, that different ways of teaching will serve different children best, but not, I think, meaningful for some and rote for others, but there is a sentence of Dr. Jensen's that I would endorse heartily after I make one change. Dr. Jensen writes as if we should have different educational aims for different children. And I think we must all live in the same world and must therefore all study pretty much the same things, even though, of course, there will be advanced specialization for each person in different areas. But the core of the program, those aims have to be the same. Let me edit that out and then endorse this sentence. The ideal of equality of educational opportunity should not be interpreted as uniformity of facilities and instructional techniques for all children. Diversity rather than uniformity of approaches would seem to be the key to making education rewarding 
for children of different patterns of ability. Now, the job of deciphering those different patterns of ability and inventing the educational methods to fit them is the research job that we have only very recently embarked upon. Thank you, Dr. Kronbeck. We continue our discussion with Professor Sigurel, Professor of Sociology, University of California, Santa Barbara. Professor Jensen advocates a thesis that appears to be twofold. On the one hand, that environmentalists have taken an ide ideological position in their denunciation of the role of genetic factors in IQ and scholastic achievement, but no systematic studies to support their, their position. And second, that his survey of the literature and the research produced by his own laboratory are findings that do not have, quote, an ax to grind, unquote, but are objective scientific studies that are invariant to the present social conditions in the United States. The question of who is being ideological remains an open issue for me. I want to question the theoretical framework directly, as well as his findings on the grounds that he has been selective in both theory and method and findings. The teachers in teaching plans of compensatory education programs, like Head Start, have not been well conceived because they are not articulated with what we are only beginning to learn about dialect differences in language development, for example, and the use of particular syntactic constructions and vocabularies from standard American English to teach classes used in, uh, and used in IQ and other tests. We have several generations of teachers who are not prepared to incorporate recent developments in language behavior research into their teaching and of disadvantaged students, much less middle-income students. The teachers must be retooled. Tests have to be constructed that incorporate research on dialect differences of, of a syntactic and phonological and semantic nature, and teachers must be alerted to their use of language in the classroom. We have very little information on what children, quote, hear, unquote, and understand in classrooms and when given tests. It is enormously difficult to write grammars on Chicano or black children in order to assess the child's developmental level of acquisition so as to know what must be devised in the way of teaching procedures to permit adequate language use in the classroom and on tests. Then we have to know how to use the child's confidence in his dialect to teach abstract thinking while we seek to show the child how to link the child's dialect to standard American English. Now this same problem exists in other countries. There's one nice study by the Romneys in Mexico which reveals this with respect to Indian and Spanish-speaking Mexicans. And there are also studies of the deaf, which I'll come back to, which have the same point to make. Giving tests and teaching Head Start or any other level to be used for evaluation purposes should be suspended until we have alternatives to current usages of standard American English. Our research at Santa Barbara even makes problematic some of the linguistic and psycho psycholinguistic findings about the significance of the child's developmental stages of language acquisition. We have a great deal of evidence now repeating the child's phonological and syntactic development, but we know very little about the semantic development. Thus, the child's comprehension of what he hears and, and says is not at all clear. Thus, we tend to be fooled by phonological and syntactic competence and performance and assume that semantic development is equivalent. Research by William LeBoff and June Murray McKay here at Berkeley and Dan Sloban and Claudia Mitchell uh, suggests that the underlying phonological and syntactic differences in black and white dialects can be linked systematically, but the semantic component is not clear. Thus, we have to recognize these dialect differences and take them into account when teaching and giving tests to disadvantaged students. The semantic component is much more complex and is tied to the child's conception of his environment as lived in, and here, the linguistic and psycholinguistic research are deficient. But recent anthropological and sociological work on sociolinguistics and ethnosemantics are providing more knowledge of this area. Thus, we are trying to show how the child acquires some sense of social organization or social structure and encodes his conceptions into language and paralanguage representations and then decodes such activities generated by others. For some time, teachers have, quote, coached, unquote, their students before taking formal tests administered by school districts for the state. We need to study such activities in conjunction with the use of language. 
But my general point is that all of the recent research on language development and conceptual thinking and how these interrelate and the problematic issues uh, of recent de uh, developmental language studies are really not addressed by Jensen. Thus, his work and that of others take for granted the ins that instruction and the tests used are valid, meaningful, and clear-cut indicators of the child's abilities, potentialities, and achievements. I have claimed then that uh, the evidence on language development and the acquisition and use of language and meaning sharply questions most of Jensen's conclusions and reveals that we are very much in the dark about how even to study the problems facing disadvantaged and advantaged students, much less know how to make practical changes. In this, if you read the paper in question, I think you'd be misled somewhat. I think you have to read other papers by Professor Jensen, particularly the one that appeared in a volume by Deutsch, Katz, and Jensen called Social Class and Verbal Learning. For here he gives his theory of learning, and is that theory of learning which I'm questioning. Jensen's discussion of verbal development processes and their psychological consequences does not reveal a good grasp of the recent literature, but instead shows that he follows a viewpoint that has been under heavy attack within psychology and linguistics for some 15 years. Jensen does not reveal an appreciation of, of recent developments in cognitive studies, particularly developmental psycholinguistic studies of the acquisition of communicative competence in children done and being carried out at the present time. Note the following. He says, quote, the child's vocalizations which normally occur in the first year of life and are forerunners of speech must be reinforced or rewarded by certain kinds of responses from other persons if they are to persist and develop in the speech. The more reinforcement, the better. And apparently, the fewer the number of persons from whom reinforcement comes, the better. He goes on to say, in the typical lower class home, there is reportedly less verbal play, less verbal interaction, and less reinforcing behavior on the part of the older members of the household in response to the child's early vocalizations than is generally found in middle class homes. The beginning of speech is therefore more likely to be delayed within a lower class environment. Now Jensen relies on a stimulus response kind of model or paradigm for explaining the development of speech in children. and. I think that uh, here is where one of the problems occurs. This particularly is reference about the role of reinforcement. A recent paper by Lindeberg in Science, May 9th, 1969, and Lindeberg's book on the biological foundations of language, I think call into question, not to mention a fantastic amount of other research by people like Roger Brown and Dave McNeil and, uh, and Miller, et cetera, that uh, this question of reinforcement has to be made quite problematic. The differences that he reports about lower and middle class environments are clearly too general from the research that is now going on. The middle class mother seems to pre-train her, her child so as to acquire proficiency, proficiency in discriminating and producing standard American English, thus preparing them for a school system and learning setting that almost exclusively emphasizes such language usage for the evaluation of competence and performance in the child. Now, Compare this statement by uh, Lenneberg when he says, this is the, the, jet, uh, the, uh, the language does not come about by simple imitation, but that the child abstracts regularities or relations from the language he hears, which he then applies to building up language for himself as an apparatus of principles. This speaks to Professor Kronbeck's comments about uh, rote and drill. In most of the studies, to continue quoting Lundberg, of this topic, the effect of certain variations in social environment, the language development of children in orphanages or middle or socially deprived households has been compared with that of children in so-called normal middle-class environments. Statistically significant differences are usually reported, which is sometimes taken as a demonstration that language development is contingent on specific language training. That certain aspects of the environment are absolutely essential for language development is undeniable but it's important to distinguish between what the children actually do and what they can do. Lindenberg points out, there is nothing particularly surprising and revealing in the demonstration that language deficits occur in children who hear no language, very little language, or only the discourse of uneducated persons. But what interests us is the underlying capacity for language. Now he says, Lindenberg points out, that, um, that hearing children born to deaf parents do not become retarded in their language development. We have been studying such a child over in San Francisco for the past nine months, and there's, there, as far as we can tell, we now are able to start teaching that child how to speak, and we don't expect him to be behind any other child who has not had that kind of verbal input 
for now two years and nine months. Now, Lenneberg's comments, uh, I think, are very essential here. He says, tests which are essential inventories of vocabulary and syntactic constructions are likely to reflect simply the deficiencies of the environment. They obscure the child's potentialities and capabilities. I have used the scheme, the schema described to compare the speech development of children in many different societies, some of them much more primitive than our own. In none of these studies could I find evidence of variation in developmental rate, despite the enormous differences in social environment. Now, Jensen's entire thesis, as outlined in several of his papers, does not show, I think, an understanding of the difference between capability and performance, particularly capability as linguists and psycholinguists and anthropological linguists are, are now trying to, to get at. Now, I think it's significant that research in the Institute of Human Learning, where Professor Jensen is also located, is, is developing uh, materials that are contrary to his own findings. I'm surprised he's not aware of this research or that he doesn't refer to it. Now, the, the tests measure a particular kind of socialization experience and proficiency within that environment, assuming it does even that task well, but it does not seem to me measure or indicate genetic differences in language and, uh, or other intellectual capabilities. It measures performance vis-a-vis -vis particular conceptual tasks valued in certain segments of Western society. The material on the deaf in Lindenberg's work and our own work in Santa Barbara reveal that the reinforcement theory alone cannot account for the crucial features of language acquisition. Jensen claims, quote, while the child can engage in other forms of learning, such as the acquisition of motor skills, uh, largely, I'm sorry, while the child can engage in other forms of learning, such as the acquisition of motor skills, it largely depends on the interaction with the inanimate environment. Language acquisition depends largely upon interaction with a, another person, and the emotional quality and intensity of this interpersonal relationship is believed to play a crucial role in the process. The shaping of the child's speech sounds through the differential reinforcing behavior of the parent is carried on in their efforts to have the child's speech patterns match their own. This shaping of speech by the parent also constitutes training and auditory discrimination, which in turn facilitates further language development. Compare Lenneberg, quote, a little boy starts washing his hands before dinner no sooner than when his parents decide that training in cleanliness should begin. However, children begin to speak no sooner and no later than when they reach a, a given stage of physical maturation. There are individual variations in development, particularly with respect to age correlation. It is interesting that language development correlates better with motor development than it does with chronological age. Nevertheless, there is evidence that the, the statistical relation between motor and language development is not due to any immediate causal relation. Peripheral motor disabilities can occur that do not delay language acquisition. Now, I think that uh, Jensen's conception of how speech is developed and it is confused with how particular forms of speech used in middle-income polite discourse in the classroom and giving and taking IQ tests and in taking regular examinations in the classroom. The training given in middle-income homes does not prepare, does prepare the middle-income child for more success in a school environment that is predicated on the assumption that it is middle-income language and its <coughs> emphasis on conceptual abstract thinking that really counts. But neither Head Start programs nor other enrichment programs will make up for such differences if we have no understanding of how the disadvantaged child, disadvantaged in a middle-income educational system, thinks and speaks, and how to teach him to move from one system to the other. It is extremely difficult to really understand the kinds of thinking that occurs in children when they are using a different dialect and you're using a standard dialect. You have to do a much more profound kind of, of syntactic analysis on the one hand, and that kind of analysis requires a great deal of time and effort and also some skill. It's not easy to, to even get the subject to respond. One of the problems we have had with young children, ages three through nine and 10, in our study is in, in videotaping their ability to act out sentences with each other, is that many of them simply will not warm up, even with the teacher and in their own classroom. It may take hours to get them to even perform this. You can induce them with toys or anything else and they won't perform. Now we move right into the home and do this and we find more success. We take the video equipment in the home with the family, the neighbors and relatives, and we have a little more success, but even there the child doesn't feel relaxed. It's extremely difficult to even get adequate samples of this child's speech and what we could call his normal usage. It's even more difficult than to analyze that speech and understand how he uses that to communicate his own ideas 
and how he understands what the teacher is trying to say to him. If the teacher's speech is standard American English, we have no idea of what that child actually hears in that classroom, much less the instructions he receives in the classroom or in taking a test. We have only now begun to study this in the school system in Goleta, where we're trying to see how the child comprehends what the teacher is telling him. Clearly, we cannot use tests that are claimed to be standardized if we don't even know the language that is being used to mediate these tests, or if we don't know what the child knows about different kinds of languages. I can't elaborate much of this, but perhaps this evening I will go into some of the research that uh, has been done that shows that there isn't any basic difference, so far as we can tell, between the syntactic structure of dialect black speech, let's say, and American English. But there are lots of differences in how you would score someone's, quote, correct response on the surface level. And if you just take that surface level, you will be terribly misled. And I think even the studies that Professor Jensen refers by Berider, for example, are misleading. They are misleading linguistically and psycholinguistically. And I think that if they had spent more time understanding the recent research, and Berider does refer to a paper by Brown and Belugi and one by Kazdan, but rather old at this point. The more recent work, it seems to me, has been totally ignored. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sigurd. We have now had a number of critiques and it is perhaps time for Dr. Jensen uh, to make some comments on these. Fine, thank you. I have to uh, deploy my comments here very carefully in the limited time available. <clears throat> Since I am more in, uh, in agreement with uh, Professor Sikorell and my other uh, discussants, I'll begin with him in hopes that I won't use up too much of my time on this. The uh, paper from which uh, uh, Professor Sikorell quotes in the Deutsch, Katz, and Jensen volume on social class, race, and psychological development was written five years ago and at that time represented, I think, a very a clear and accurate account of the way uh, learning psychologists thought uh, about speech acquisition. It summarized most of the current um, research at that time. Since then, however, I have become acquainted with the work of uh, Leonard Berg, uh, Kasdan, Sloban, Urban Tripp, and others, um, and uh, have been, I would say, almost completely convinced by their uh, arguments and data. And I now believe, which I did not believe as strongly in 1964, that developmental uh, maturational factors play a much larger part in language development than had formerly been believed. Uh, I'm in uh, total agreement with uh, Sheldon White's uh, comment that the child's incre uh, increasingly sophisticated use of language reflects his increasing, um, uh, increasing complexity and sophistication of his cognitive structures rather than the other way around. And uh, <coughs> I'm glad that uh, Professor Sikorell mentioned the correlation between language development and motor development. I think these are all part of one uh, developmental process. And uh, if this observation is interesting in view of uh, Doris Entwistle's recent research in Baltimore on uh, lower class Negro children as compared with uh, middle and upper middle class white children in the suburbs of Baltimore in uh, linguistic development. In the most basic, basic syntactical aspects of language development, it turns out that the uh, Baltimore uh, lower class Negro children show no uh, retardation uh, up to uh, kindergarten age, at least. And in fact, there is some precocity, uh, which goes along with the motoric precocity found in Negro children uh, early in life on uh, infant scales of intelligence. So this, uh, these findings are all uh, quite consistent in that respect. It's also very apparent that communication uh, probably depends uh, as much, or I would say probably more, on the stage of development of the child's cognitive structures than upon uh, more superficial aspects of language, such as dialect and specific uh, vocabulary, uh, given the condition that the children are speaking uh, some version of the same language. And experiments by Krauss and by Kasdan are very interesting in this respect. Uh, for example, they have done experiments in which they tape recorded 
a lower class Negro child describing a set of pictures. Um, and then this tape is played and they've had uh, middle class uh, white children uh, describe the same pictures on tape. And then these tapes are played to lower class Negro children and to middle class white children and uh, the child has to pick out on a multiple choice test the picture that's being described. This is a rather neat um, and simple experimental design. And the order of ability to pick these pictures out in terms of the uh, two groups we've mentioned, really four groups, the two encoding groups and the two decoding groups, goes like this, that white children understand white children the best. There's more communication there. The second, is that the uh, <coughs> white children understand the Negro children next best. The next is that the Negro children understand the white children next best. And the least communication goes on between the Negro child and the Negro child in this situation. Both the uh, Krauss study and the um, uh, Kasdan study uh, show the same uh, effect. And there are other studies uh, in this line, but they're not as, uh, as well controlled or as convincing as these two. So uh, on the whole, I would say that I'm uh, in agreement with Professor Sicarell. So I think I will go back now to uh, Professor Stinchcomb's remarks, um, which strike me as being based largely on conjecture and surmise and supposition about various things. And in many cases, the, the conjectures and suppositions uh, are uh, contrary to the evidence that does exist. Uh, <clears throat> let's take the, um, uh, the matter of uh, regression toward the population mean of uh, Negro and white children from their parents when the parents are put into social class uh, categories. I think that uh, Stinchcomb's comment that the mean in each social class category is probably uh, almost undoubtedly uh, lower for the Negroes than for the whites. Um, and that there are uh, reliability or unreliability factors in the measurement of social class that would uh, uh, cause regression effects also. All I can suggest there is that we get better data such as the IQs of the parents rather than the social class placement of the parents and look at the regression effects and see if predictions made on the basis of genetic assumptions lead to uh, uh, more, an a more accurate fit of the data than assumptions made on uh, strictly environmental uh, bases, which as far as I know, uh, don't, uh, shouldn't uh, yield any um, marked regression effect in the prediction. Now, we do have regression data on siblings reared in the same family for Negroes and for whites. Now, here we have children reared in a much more similar environments than uh, Negroes and whites uh, are placed in when there's a class by social class category. And the regression lines are not significantly different for siblings in the Negro than in the white group. And uh, the regression lines are linear in both groups, showing sibling average si sibling correlations not significantly different from 0.5. Uh, the occupational reliability, which was uh, uh, deplored, is actually quite high to my surprise. It's a uh, 0.81 to 0.86 in various groups, according to uh, Professor Stinchcomb. Uh, and of course, if we don't like that, we can correct our measurements for attenuation and see if this improves the, the fit of the regression model to what would be predicted on a genetic basis. Uh, also, it was mentioned that occupation changes uh, over the um, the, well, the lifetime of the individual, which is true, and it probably changes for the better uh, in most cases. That is, ch persons uh, move up occupationally. Uh, if this were a, a marked effect, that is, if the general environment correlated with a person's occupation were a marked environmental effect, it would seem hard to me to explain why first-born children have higher IQs than later-born children. Uh, <clears throat> Then uh, Professor Stinscombe says that I believe that the, the environment works in spurts. No, I don't believe that. I do, uh, however, cite studies in which there are spurts in the environment. And psychologists have uh, sought out such studies because they demonstrate how the environment works more dramatically and, uh, than uh, other studies might. So you have famous studies like the uh, 
skeels and dye uh, orphanage children who were moved, removed from a very deprived uh, orphanage environment into quite uh, relatively enriched environments. And this is a spurt in environment, and it resulted in a 30-point spurt in IQ within one year. Uh, later enrichment of the environment, when the children were put into uh, good uh, average homes, uh, added just another uh, three or four uh, points to the IQ. The, the largest spurt uh, that's ever been documented, to my knowledge, was uh, reported by uh, Professor Kingsley Davis on this campus of a girl reared for six years in an attic by a deaf-mute mother. At the age of six, she had a mental age of one year, seven months, an IQ of 25 or 30. Uh, within two years after that, her mental age jumped up to around eight, and she was doing normal uh, schoolwork. So that is what I would call a spurt, and indicates that the environment can have quite rapid effects if the child's actual maturational level is able to take advantage of the environment. Now, there are other uh, uh, things in uh, Stinchcomb's argument that I think just have to be taken exception to because they simply don't accord with the known facts. For example, the fact that one half of the racial difference can be attributed to 20 hours a week um, uh, by uh, of, in a, of a Negro in a white classroom, and this is based on the correlations in the Coleman study. Now, Coleman has been very uh, cautious to point out that uh, these children were not placed in classrooms on a random basis, that the school integration is a matter of neighborhood selection, and it uh, would be ridiculous, I believe, to attribute the difference found between Negro children who are in nearly all white classes and Negro children in all black classes to uh, the effect of the classroom environment. Coleman makes no such claim and, uh, in fact, uh, disclaims this. Uh, one other thing that I may mention, and this I can tie in with uh, Professor... Oh, let me see. One other thing uh, that Stinchcomb uh, brings up is the additive effect of the environment. Now, it's possible to account for over 200% uh, of the variance in IQ scores in terms of studies of the environment. If you simply go through and take every environmental factor that's been shown to correlate with uh, IQ uh, in the literature, square the correlation to get the percentage of variance accounted for and add these up, you get an enormous environmental component. Now, if there's anything we know about environment, it's that the effects are not additive in this sense. The effects are correlated, so you have to uh, subtract this correlational term, and when this is done, you end up accounting for about 20% of the environment, uh, of the variance in terms of in, uh, what you can measure with the environment. Most studies are uh, in agreement on this particular point. There are also environmental threshold effects, such that when the environment is adequate with respect to a number of um, crucial uh, factors, uh, the addition of other factors that are known to correlate with intelligence doesn't produce any additional uh, uh, input. It's something like taking uh, vitamins. If you have enough vitamin uh, C, taking twice as much doesn't make you that much healthier. Then um, I'll come briefly in the two minutes left to um, Professor Kronbach's uh, paper. Uh, I don't say that environment can't add to behavior. Obviously, if I believe that, I wouldn't believe in education. Uh, what I am saying is that environment accounts for very little of the variations among persons. It's very little of the total uh, intelligence variance. I'm not saying that if that persons reared in deprived environments would be uh, would have as much knowledge or as many skills develop skills as they have in an enriched environment that's uh, should be clear now the chart up here is based on uh, the army alpha studies uh, between world war one and world war two conducted by professor tuddenham and i i think that the chart is misleading in the sense that kronbach was talking about iq and the hereditary base of IQ with that rather narrow scatter diagram there showing the range of variation that's possible with a heritability of 80. The Army Alpha tests are very heavily loaded uh, with uh, educational uh, material. They're really scholastic achievement tests more than uh, IQ tests as shown by the fact that they correlate over 70 with number of years in school. 
And they, as far as I know, no heritability study was, has been done using the Army Alpha, and my guess is that it would have a low heritability as do scholastic achievement tests. IQ tests, which are known to have high heritability, have shown only uh, one or two points increase between generations. The Scottish National Survey is a good example of this, where they gave the Stanford Binet a generation apart to all children born on a certain date in Scotland, a completely, uh, you know, a perfect uh, sampling procedure. Uh, four, they took four days at random from the year and took all children born on those days, not missing a one, and uh, found a gain of only a couple of points uh, per generation uh, in Stanford Binet IQs. Um, so I think that, that has to be taken into account. And if you're using Army Alpha for that graph, that scatter diagram, I would imagine, would have to be a much uh, more spherical or a circular um, scatter plot. Now, uh, one other last point with respect to a Kronbach's um, comment, um, and that has to do with the use of rote learning in uh, school learning. I am very concerned about the fact that children who show on rote learning tests, paired associate learning, serial learning, memory span, free recall, and so forth, whose performance on these tests is equivalent to that of middle class or even an upper middle class white children, uh, that these children get through school without being able to read or do arithmetic, and that 24 percent of the um, uh, student body in, in a school like Berkeley High has a uh, fifth grade reading level. So this seems inexcusable to me when these children have demonstrated capacity to learn in a learning situation. Therefore, I am not advocating that all of these children be placed before memory drums during all of their school days and taught paired associates. I am saying that we have to discover ways to tap and build on this obvious ability that I, my own research has demonstrated. And uh, I believe that all well, 90%, the upper 90% of any uh, segment of the population uh, in the schools uh, is capable of acquiring what I call the basic scholastic skills, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, and uh, the acquisition of this may be facilitated by tapping uh, these abilities that, the, that these children have demonstrated in my uh, laboratory experiments. And I believe that perhaps some uh, problem solving and conceptual strategies can be taught by means of the abilities the children already have, and that's what we are working on now. Uh, there are many other things that could be said on this topic, and there are many points in my paper that have not been uh, uh, discussed uh, by the panel as yet, but I see that my time has run out. So thank, thank you, you Dr. Jensen. We have heard now from uh, people in education, in sociology, and in various areas of sociology and from different campuses. And we are now coming to the last two uh, critical comments by two biologists, two geneticists, of which the first one is Professor Libby. Please. Well, I'd like to address my opening remarks, not so much to this panel or even to this audience, but to the larger audience that will be watching this tape. And in particular, I think to the audience that will watch it on the Berkeley campus tonight. I'd like to identify several of my biases in being here with respect to three questions which I think are implicit in our having the symposium at all. The first of these questions is an exceedingly personal question. It is, is Professor Jensen a racist? Now, a couple years ago, in the aftermath of the free speech movement here, when nationwide attention was centered on Berkeley, William F. Buckley, I believe on his firing line, had a program in which the major question addressed then was our apparent proclivity to hire left-wing and promote left-wing professors on this campus. And the man that was defending us at the University of California said, well, yeah, that seems to be the case. We have a large number of these, but these people are hired and promoted on the basis of their scholarship in their particular fields and not on the basis of their particular political views. 
Buckley then asked this man, whose name I'm afraid I forget, whether the University of California hired and promoted racists. And it threw him into a little bit of a off-balance situation. And then he began to answer it, in my opinion, rather badly, in that he said, no, uh, we didn't. And Buckley, in pursuing this, said, well, doesn't this seem inconsistent with your previous statements? And the guy said, well, I don't think a racist could make it on the Berkeley faculty. He just wouldn't have enough smarts, or some paraphrase to that extent. Well, I was very interested then, a month ago, uh, because I had, I had felt at that point that Buckley had intellectually won the argument in terms of the objectivity of the Berkeley campus. And from there on, it was just a matter of burying the body on the rest of that program. And so I had been looking as a sort of a personal thing for the last two years for a bona fide racist on the Berkeley campus where I could drop Buckley a line and say, look, we have one or more, however many I found. And I was interested a month ago then when Professor Jensen was identified for us as certainly an intelligent and functioning member of this Berkeley campus as a racist. Now, in order to really put this racist label on somebody, I suppose you have to define what a racist is, and it's possible, it's a rather ill-defined term, to define it as broadly uh, so that if you can tell the difference between black and yellow, you are racist, and that would include, I suppose, all of us in this room, or so narrowly that it's very difficult for anyone to be a racist. I'm not going to attempt such a definition, but suggest there's sort of a gut reaction of what, a, what is meant by a racist in terms of this charge that was made. The other thing that's necessary to answer this question, I suppose, is to get very personally into Professor Jensen's mind and find out what it is that drives him to do the studies he does and say the things he does, and I'm not capable of that. The only thing I can say, again in identifying my own biases, is that I've known Professor Jensen for a couple of years now, and during this period we've talked about genetic things, mostly, and about things that impinge on race. So I would answer, no, I don't think he is. And I, would, I think I would stress that. No, I think in the ugly sense of bigot, or one who arbitrarily suppresses other races, uh, I don't believe Professor Jensen is a racist. The second question is, is his paper important and is it good? I think the first is rather self-answered by the fact we're here at all. Yes, I think it's a very important paper. And again, in my opinion, although you may get a feeling that people disagree with me, I think it's a very good paper. The third question, and here's an important one, is should he have done it? Should he have done this kind of research at all? And having done this kind of research, did he have any right to publish it? Well, the easy way out of this question, I think, is to fall back on the motherhood academic freedom sort of defense, i.e., a professor should have the right to do his academic thing, no matter how ridiculous it is, no matter how dangerous it is. It's the argument the truth will out somehow, and truth is good. And as a matter of fact, Professor Jensen rather uses this argument himself in his paper to defend his doing it. I would like to not use that argument, but I would like to attack it in a much more open framework. I think, yes, in, in the broad open marketplace, of whether people should do things or not. Yes, I think he should have done this work for one reason, because I think both science and society are ready for it, although people would disagree with this. For another reason, that it addresses itself in a fairly fundamental way to two of the most important questions facing mankind today. One, the question of race itself, and second, the quality of man's life. I think the paper both summarizes and synthesizes much what, for me anyway, was information in scattered places that I didn't have the time or the interest to get myself. But more important, it produces hypotheses that demand further work. Now, the paper has been criticized by some that say, you shouldn't have said that because bureaucrats are going to use it as an excuse for turning off support for types of research in this area. This may be true. I, I'm not very good at 
predicting bureaucrat behavior, but I think certainly in terms of the importance of the questions and in terms of the questions asked, it demands much more support than it gives reasons for turning support off. Finally, I think that it should be read. I think that it should be thought about. I think that it should be discussed. And I think that in some rather specific ways, it should be acted on. The second thing I'd like to talk about are some quibbles I have with the paper. As a quantitative geneticist, I was told by some of my students that Professor Jensen's presentation of the section on quantitative genetics was both clear and simple, and therefore very good. Some of the purists, uh, mathematical or geneticist, in the audience or otherwise, may find some errors in that, as I did myself, and I'll give you an example of one. For instance, Professor Jensen, in talking about additive genetic variants, mentioned that this is brought about by genes acting additively. However, that's a little bit too simple. You can also get rather major contributions to additive genetic variants by dominance gene systems, or even over-dominance, provided that the population is not in equilibrium with the fitness values of those genes. And this is a fairly common phenomenon. So you can find a purist that would quibble. My main point is that in looking over this section, while I found little errors, and therefore would not recommend that this be used as a textbook in quantitative genetics, I don't think that these small errors blunt the weight of his arguments and genetic evidence in terms of the quantitative genetics being approached. Finally, the thing I suppose I'm supposed to talk about after these ramblings are some contribution to the academic thought here. I would like to call your attention to this display over here and suggest that maybe instead of talking about a simple sort of is it caused by heredity or is it caused by environment or is it caused by how much of each, we talk about the genetic or rather the biological architecture of populations. And this is a much more complicated thing, I think, than simply talking about the nature-nurture thing as if this was a two-dimensional model. I don't expect most of you to understand all that stuff, and even if you did, it's over simple. But I put it there to give you some sort of an idea that the biological architecture of a species, when looked at in terms of contributions to variation, can be a pretty complicated thing. I think if there is a critique implied here, it is not so much a critique of the paper or Professor Jensen, who does not draw very powerful conclusions from the data, but it would be a critique of anyone drawing very serious conclusions from data presently available. I think this is also an attempt to map the seas upon which we are now launched, if in fact we are going to really biologically investigate the architecture of our human species relative to ability, intelligence, and things like that. I'd like to go through this and point out some of the main landmarks on this chart. In the upper half, you see a major heading called Total Genetic and identified by a variant symbol, a sigma squared sub G. And in this, you see two subgroups. One is indicating that the total genetic variation within a species can be divided to a within population components. And I believe this is the level that most of the data cited in Professor Jensen's article has been dealing with. And actually, there's a subcomponent in that, a within families genetic component, because segregation genetically goes on in families. Then you have a thing called between populations within races. And as examples, perhaps, uh, we have the uh, white population of London as contrasted to the rural population of England as contrasted to the white population in Vienna. Or you can contrast the upper social economic status group in London with a lower social economic status group, and this would be an equally valid between populations within races contrast. And I believe there is probably a genetic component, as Professor Jensen suggests, associated with this. And finally, the thing that I think brings most of us here with our nerves on edge is this question of the genetic component between races. And I'll just let it sit there for the moment and drop down to the next little subgroup, 
which is really a different dimension of looking at the genetic variability within populations. This divides it, as I've already indicated, into additive or genic variation. This is the kind that's useful if you were to launch into a eugenic program for breeding or plain breeding in almost any other species in which we don't have these moral problems, or if you were to worry about such things as differential breeding without any eugenics implied, but just what's going on in terms of differential breeding in different segments of the population. This is the segment you have to look at, is this additive genetic component of variance. I have vastly oversimplified the non-additive genetic part, and I won't even bother to identify them other than saying I could string symbols all the way around the room and not run out of components we could have there. But these are the things that behave unpredictably in a breeding parent-offspring situation. Then finally, Professor Jensen in his paper handles assortative mating as if it is a separate component of variance, and I think that may be a valid way of handling it. This is an oversimple way, but I think it's a little more to the point. It says that if people who are very much alike mate with each other, their offspring are going to be more removed from the mean than if people who mate, mate with each other at random, or worse yet, people who mate with each other who are rather unalike, which will tend to bring the offspring to the mean. So the important thing there is that little k, which can be plus or minus one, and will tend to inflate or deflate the amount of genetic variance that's around, not only the additive portion, but some of the other portions. One of the interesting things in Professor Jensen's paper, which I can't resist commenting on, is the difference between Negro and white IQ, standard deviations. And I think perhaps this feature may play a part in that difference. I don't think it necessarily totally explains it, but this could be implicated. The second major division there is a thing called the total environmental variation, similarly labeled sigma squared sub e. And again, without going into the bloody details of those upper things, we have within families variation, between families variation, between social economic status variation, between populations, between races. These are environmental things which are more or less common to different populations, different races, different status groups, which result in variation between them. I might just again give Professor Stinchcombe an aside and say, while I haven't done much in the area of intelligence testing, I have done an awful lot in situations where we thought we had the environmental variation controlled, and I think it's outrageous, too, how much environmental variation you get within families, but the fact is you get an outrageous amount of it within families. Finally, and here may be one of the most important things I say, is that funny little thing called sigma squared sub c, which I am aware that Professor Jensen is aware of, but for some reason he didn't really cover in his paper. Now, if there is a place where the bones of contention we are hearing today fall, it is in that component. Because that is a thing that says, here are elements of the environment that are common to some group we are measuring, families, social economic status groups, races, whatever they are, and they are masquerading as consistent variation, and therefore we are interpreting them as genetic variation when in fact they are not. And I would implicate all of those above levels of possible within variation, environmental variation, as depending on the situation, depending on how you measure things, capable of falling into this common component such that this can lead to a bias in your interpretation of the experiment. This is getting into a matter of more art than science, or at least maybe more science than we've got available now to identify these common components, but that's the villain if we're going to point to a villain in this genetic architecture of a species. There are two other things there that are rather given equal weight. One is the covariance of genotype and environment. I will say that I think this is an interesting thing. It may also be implicated in the difference between Negro and white standard deviation. I think Professor Jensen does an excellent job of discussing this component in his paper. The next one down, genotype-environment interaction, I would quibble with him again. He doesn't discuss it that well, and furthermore, he says this is a small component in human populations, and I suspect, without checking his data, that he's mostly dealing on genotype-environment interaction where the genetic variance is coming from within populations. We find, in looking at other organisms, that frequently when you're looking at between population levels, this genotype-environment interaction becomes very significant, and I would 
throw out without a bit of data at hand that this again may be an important thing to look at relative to humans if Professor Jensen's criteria are right about the importance of heredity in determining things like ability and intelligence I would say that this is one of the most hopeful things we have because it says some people are good for doing one thing genetically and others are good for doing other things genetically and what we have to do is maximize them we have to play to their strengths rather than try to cram into some single mold everybody in one criterion of excellence the bottom two things I think I will skip they just say this is a complicated business when you try to put these things together thank you Dr. Libby we are now coming to Dr. Lederberg We now come to our last speaker, Professor Joshua Lederberg. I have both the uh, advantage and the burden of uh, following a group of speakers, uh, most of whom have said just the things I would have liked to have been able to say myself and have the emotional advantage of expressing myself directly. And uh, I must refrain from that redundancy. Uh, identify myself with most of the criticisms that have been expressed here and I might add as well also many of the compliments and uh, supportive remarks that have been uh, stated for Dr. Jensen's position as a scientist. But I do think his paper has a major flaw, and that is that having stressed carefully that the question of the genetic basis of differences in performance among races was undecidable on the, ba on the basis of present evidence, that evidence having consisted entirely of studies within fairly narrow population groups, he then nevertheless proceeded to enlarge on a scheme that implied that this speculation was founded on true fact. And I think it's very important, it ought to be stamped on the cover of the uh, document that's been distributed, that that issue is in fact undecidable on the basis of present evidence. And in fact, it's very difficult to sketch out a research methodology that could be realistically expected to be able to completely cancel out the environmental factors that might contribute to differences in performance between races until we actually achieve the social goal of color blindness, which is not only unavailable at the present time, uh, but in fact many people dispute as to whether it should be achieved. The issue of the genetic basis of intelligence between the races is undecidable. I can understand uh, Dr. Jensen's reflexes to the dogmatic environmentalism of many of his colleagues in educational psychology who have made a somewhat different assertion, namely that the issue is decided and have made the assertion that it is a matter of scientific fact that there are no significant genetic differences pertaining to intelligence among the races. That's another statement of exactly the same issue it is undecidable on the basis of present evidence, and I, again, do not see any simple methodology by which we can approach that particular question. There is another flaw in the paper, and that has to do with the discussion of the probable dysgenic effects of selective breeding of individuals with lower intelligence. It is indeed true that uh, given assumptions about the heritability of intelligence that follow his major premise, and given the assertions about the apparent selective value of lower intelligence, that we should see a further accumulation of genes for lower intelligence in any population where this happens. This can be attacked at several points. The one I would particularly like to point out is that the dysgenic effect, that is to say the selective breeding on the basis of lower intelligence as presented in this paper, fails to take into account those individuals whose intelligence falls below the threshold for effective performance in society, the institutionalized uh, individuals of even greater mental defect, and even further than that, those whose accumulation of deleterious genes results in their failure at a physical level, so that they fail to survive either as infants or even as fetuses. And any reasonable model of the way in which such genes interact with one another 
would suggest that a considerable part of that pool under recombination is dumped into the lower extreme of this distribution in such a way that we do not have a simple view of the selective value of these genes. That where we see examples of higher fertility among groups of lower intelligence, we're only looking at the middle uh, in a qualitative sense of the distribution and ignoring the truncated ends. This is as speculative as the assertion that we are facing a dysgenic crisis of major magnitude. And the other point, of course, about that is that we have to consider the time scale over which this can be expected to have any really significant impact on the gene pool. We're obviously living through a period of demographic transition throughout the world and throughout this country, and I think we can well uh, tolerate a generation or two of confusion on this issue until we get much more detailed scientific information before we attempt to mobilize stringent, vehement social actions that carry even more serious byproducts than the disease that they hope to cure. Further on that one issue, one does not have to appeal to genetic arguments, and I would hope that we do not appeal to genetic arguments to encourage the dissemination of family planning ideas throughout the population. There are very good here and now phenotypic reasons for wanting to support limitation of family size within the desires of a family uh, without invoking genetic considerations in any way whatsoever. And I think these discussions are, if anything, counterproductive in that they naturally produce a serious counterreaction against assertions that the poor should be restrained from multiplying because they're inherently unfit. Having few other resources to react to that situation, uh, excessive proliferation may indeed be their revenge. I might also quote J.B.S. Haldane's uh, suggestion for solving that problem, uh, that is the negative correlation between uh, income and fertility, and that is if we make the rich poor, we may help to ensure the appropriate proliferation of their supposedly advantageous <laughs> genes. And this is probably at least as plausible an approach to solving this problem as any of the other realistic measures that have been proposed for it. Dr. Jensen does help to open a number of issues that do demand deeper inquiry, but I have to react that we are frustrated in such inquiries much more by the lack of a, an effective methodology, uh, and I speak, when I say we, I mean the community of geneticists. We're frustrated much more by the lack of an effective methodology than we are about the uh, concern about whether it is socially useful or socially uh, harmful to promulgate scientific information. Uh, I take the view that we cannot solve the real problems of the world if we don't know what they are, and that there can be no socially harmful information if there is enough of it. A little information is sometimes a dangerous thing, and we have to be sure that we've carefully uh, covered uh, the entire situation and our development of it. But my main uh, concern, and I don't take this as, a, as an academic uh, criticism, my main concern about the presentation in the Dr. Jensen's report is that I don't think he's asking any very interesting questions. I think the statistical genetic approach is a result of there being an available methodology, essentially twin studies or kinship studies, and so one follows it as far as it one can. But the kinds of questions that it can hope to answer are really not very interesting and are really not very important. I think Dr. Libby touched on that briefly by his passing reference to the problem of gene-environment interaction and the certainty that this plays a major role under the heading of the variation that's labeled as genetic variation. But this is not just a statistical abstraction, and that seems to be the level at which most of this discussion has proceeded. We're dealing with the individual fates and careers, a lot of very particular individuals, each of whom has indeed quite a unique uh, genotype, and here Dr. Jensen has stated himself in full agreement with this, that we have to examine the details of that genotype uh, and its expression in terms of the uh, learning capacity of the child and its different parameters in order to know how to schedule the optical edu optimal educational regime. I believe we must do that, and I fail to see how the population studies that have been 
the basis of much of this discussion, contribute in any way to that kind of analysis. Let us admit that there are genes that influence the development of the brain, as there are genes that influence the development of every other organ in the body. Uh, this is something that there can be absolutely no quarrel about. Population studies that look only at the end result of a very complicated pattern of developmental interactions between genes for particular functions and the kind of environment the child's been exposed to tell us nothing about how to deal with a particular child. And I think we must refocus our attention on the parameters that can be observed by individual observation. I have, I could make a wry comment, uh, it's perhaps somewhat offensive. Uh, Dr. Jensen has learned genetics fairly recently and is therefore an enthusiast for it. And he plainly is an enthusiast and has become the skilled practitioner with respect to some aspects of statistical and population genetics. The really interesting work that's been going on in genetics for the last 30 or 40 years has been a very different field altogether. It has been in developmental genetics, in biochemical genetics, and learning the ways in which gene differences in fact impact on the development of the organism and the personality. And I would encourage him to continue to pursue his interest in a field which is of prime importance in educational psychology, and in which too few of his colleagues have taken an equal interest, and learn what genetics really is about these days. And this, I think, can be of great value and great use in dealing with individual children. The notion that the environmental scale can be described in linear terms is the most outrageous suggestion that I've heard here. Uh, we're dealing with specific responses of particular organ systems at different stages of, of their development. I'll enlarge on this a little further a little later on. To my view, at the present time, the, the only interesting issues are the things that we can deal with in terms of the way in which we deal with particular individual children. And I think here uh, I will not adumbrate further on aspects of educational psychology, for which there are better experts, but I'd like to put very great stress on problems of the biological health and vigor of different population groups and of the manifest injustice which is inherent in just such statistics as infant mortality, where the Negro infant mortality is almost twice that of the white throughout the country and in many areas which is much sadder discrepancies than that. Uh, how ca one can in any way uh, ignore that kind of statistics uh, and then suggest that there are comparabilities in the environment of any social class in the white group with that of the black uh, without having specifically examined just these health issues uh, I'm at a loss to explain. There's a great deal we don't understand about black infant mortality. It may have a genetic component, just as the average lower birth weight of uh, black children uh, uh, may also have a genetic component. These are very concrete issues. They could be analyzed in physiological terms. There's a possibility of getting at them by the routes of developmental analysis. It can give us some concrete and hard information that may eventually lead us to the ability to recognize particular genes that are involved in the makeup and the developmental potentiality of a, a single individual. Now we do know that there are many genes that influence the development of the central nervous system and are manifest as defects in one form of mental retardation or another. But in fact, for none of them is there any evidence that their gene frequency is particularly higher in the Negro population as compared to the Caucasian. In fact, some of them are relatively unique, for example, among Jews. Uh, now, this is probably uh, not a mark of genetic merit of the Negro population, but much more the failure to undertake the kind of intensive individual analysis of specific syndromes in that part of the population as compared to many others. But we really do need modern and topical genetic analysis of any observable and definable genetic defects whenever we can uh, see them. <coughs> We're not necessarily fatalistically discouraged by finding that a gene has a negative impact on development. The more we understand about how such genes work, the more deeply we understand the meaning of the utterly nonlinear uh, relationship of environmental quality to gene effect. Uh, different diseases, if we can now translate into that kind of model, require different and specific therapies. The most outstanding example, on which there's a great deal of experience, is hereditary deafness and deaf mutism. Uh, children born with a genetic incapacity in their hearing system were, until we learned the specific educational regimes required 
to treat that particular kind of mental retardation uh, in effect had IQs uh, bordering on zero because they were never taught how to speak, they were never taught how to learn, uh, they were the, the typical prototype village idiot. As soon as we learned those methods, uh, this issue has become a secondary one in terms of the possible intellectual development of such children. I could go on with many further examples of specific syndromes that require specific environmental reactions, not any kind of generalized improvement of the nature of the environment. The other point about which not enough has been said is the role of alienation as the fundamental issue in uh, the retardation of the black child. I'm not an expert in that field. I've heard only passing comments on the point, but it's as plain as the nose on my face or yours what a central issue this is and how bad a job we have done in convincing the black community that it is really worthwhile to strive to meet the goals of uh, middle class society. Uh, the one item that Coleman did find in his report that showed the highest correlation between the quality of a school was uh, the sense of alienation of its students. That is, this is the one parameter that showed that, that had the highest predictive value. Uh, those schools where children felt that they had no control over their environment or over their destinies and were the most poorly connected with the society in which they lived uh, were the ones that predictably had the, the worst academic performance thereafter. For this reason, I think it's a bit absurd, again, to talk about environment linear terms, or I would even have to react to uh, one of my panel colleagues on this point, the idea that a school that has 30% black children is giving the same environment, even 20 or 30 hours a week, to its black children and to its white children is an absurdity as due to the eyes of that child. And uh, this seems to me is the root problem uh, that we must address if we were to establish communication between the cultures in the society or to have any possibility of boosting IQ and scholastic achievement. If Head Start has had some successes in some areas, I think it can very plausibly be attributed in part to its effects on the improvement of the physical health of the children who participated in those programs who for the first time have had a degree of medical attention that they've never had before, and in part to the sense that the community cares and that there's some avenue of communication between the cultures. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no evidence that any other component of these programs has had a positive effect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lederberg. Uh, we are now ready to have eight different individuals ask questions or make react or present their reactions. And I have their list before me and I shall call on them. Uh, before we do this, we want to give Dr. Jensen a few brief minutes time to react to the last two speakers for which, which he had not had an opportunity before. Yes, <coughs> um, just a, a couple of comments here. Um, Professor Libby mentioned that the genotype by environment uh, interaction was stated in my paper as being uh, of rather minor uh, importance with respect to IQ measurements. <clears throat> and that appears to be true from the uh, evidence that we have, because um, the IQ is a, a gross and complex uh, measure, and it may be that uh, interactions do not show up well in that kind of measure. There's no doubt that in specific instructional situations and laboratory situations, one can find quite large individual differences by instructional method interaction if there are enough constraints in the learning situation. Where these don't exist, the interactions do appear to be smaller. Now, the, the main line of evidence that uh, persons like Sir Cyril Burt give for a small interaction <coughs> between genotype and environment uh, is the fact, for example, that identical twins reared apart who have uh, exactly the same uh, genetic uh, components uh, are as highly correlated as they are if there were a uh, genotype by, by environment interaction of any magnitude, it would certainly lower those correlations. And it would also um, make for a greater difference between the correlations of identical twins and fraternal twins. Uh, fraternal twins having only half their genes in common should uh, show some uh, interact, uh, genotype by environment interaction and this would lower the correlation below what one would expect without such an interaction and the correlations come pretty close to the same uh, that you, you have for traits such as fingerprint ridges and so on where there is 
apparently no uh, interaction term. Uh, uh, Professor Letterberg's um, paper um, makes a statement that we cannot settle issues of the question of uh, racial differences, the basis for racial differences, until we can completely cancel out or equate environments. Now, this may be stating the problem in such a way that it could never be solved, because uh, unless one can operationally define what perfectly equated environments consist of, I don't see how you could uh, perform an experiment. Uh, I agree that the uh, issue is undecidable on the basis of present, e present evidence. The argument that I made was that there, the evidence is such that the question is not an unreasonable one and that it has, that it has not been decided. Uh, the but uh, I, I would disagree that uh, the question is undecidable uh, on the basis of possible evidence. And I'm not sure that we even know yet and, until we uh, apply the, the greatest ingenuity we can uh, muster. Uh, I'm not sure that we know what all the possible kinds of evidence are. And I would advocate trying to set up experiments that would lead to uh, different predictions from environmental and from genetic uh, hypotheses. And the fact that there is no simple way to research this problem, I uh, think, should not deter us. There is uh, no simple way of putting a man on the moon, and yet we're going to do that uh, in a month or so. Uh, I believe that until uh, geneticists uh, apply the same uh, problem-solving skills to these problems that they have to other important problems, that we will not know whether or not we can come up with reasonable answers to the question. Uh, so I think that's all I will... Thank you, Dr. Jensen. And I call the, for the first discussant, uh, Dr. K from Anthropology. Will the discussants please be brief, because we have eight yes, or seven. I will try to be brief. Um, much of my fire has been stolen by Dr. Lederberg. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, and I may put things somewhat differently. That could be a contribution. First, I think uh, Professor Jensen has been, uh, uh, has ignored what are obvious, and to the layman obvious, massive cultural differences between black and white Americans. And uh, I think the reason behind this is, a, is a, a, a methodological fallacy of which Dr. Jensen is certainly not the only person who is guilty, in fact, the environmentalists are very often just as guilty. I'm neither uh, an environmentalist nor a biologicalist or something. But the fallacy is this, that uh, we control all the social variables or the environmental variables or cultural variables that we can control in a way that we have some confidence in our measurements. And then the residuum we attribute to something, in this case, to genetics. Uh, this is, it seems to me, the essence of Jensen's method. Uh, what can be measured about environmental influence? We measure. If we find residual differences after subtracting, uh, after taking account of differences that, uh, that can be accounted for by those aspects of the environment that can be measured under current social science measurement procedures, then we say that residuum is a genetic difference. Now, that's an okay method if uh, social science measurement is uh, anywhere near uh, adequate to deal with what are obviously the facts in the case, but I think it's not. Uh, let us get clear on one thing. Professor Jensen does seem to say two things uh, about this business of black-white uh, genetic versus environmental components of IQ scores. On the one hand, he says very frequently that it's an open question and deserving of scientific uh, investigation. And uh, with that, I have no quarrel. On the other hand, he frequently says things like the following. I read from page 82 of the article in Harvard Educational Review. The preponderance of the evidence is, in my opinion, less consistent with a strictly environmental hypothesis than with a genetic hypothesis. Okay. Uh, that's not exactly saying it's an open question, that's saying it's not totally solved, but the preponderance of evidence leans toward a genetic hypothesis right now, and I don't think it does. Okay, the second point 
to take up this business very briefly of the additive components of variance and IQ scores. Uh, Jensen remarks uh, on page 100 of the article in question that he has personally had occasion to uh, test people from uh, uh, so-called environmentally impoverished, impoverished or whatever it is groups uh, and that he finds that by uh, by playing a few games with uh, kids from such groups that uh, uh, if he retests them after first testing them when uh, he hasn't played such games, he says, quote, a boost in IQ of 8 to 10 points or so was the rule. Now, this is 8 to 10 points of the 15 point racial difference. Uh, he also says that when you control for gross uh, socioeconomic status that you get rid of about four points uh, now it's true that this, uh, these eight to ten points difference may have perfect correlations with all of the other environmental uh, factors so that we may still have uh, one point difference that uh, is not accounted for, but that seems to me unlikely. Now on this business of culture-free tests, uh, uh, Jensen points out that, uh, how am I doing on time, sir? Five minutes you had. Uh, I had five, and how many have I used? All? You have used five. I have used five. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, will, I would speak I'm for sorry. ten seconds. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the culture-free tests, uh, I'm referring now to uh, Professor Jensen's article on culture fair testing. The tests that he favors are those that uh, uh, test uh, abstract reasoning ability. And uh, I would submit that tests for abstract reasoning ability for, from an anthropologist's point of view are the most culturally loaded tests, which is exactly the reason that blacks score worst on them. Now, and the reason for that is very simple. That abstract reasoning ability, which is generally tested by, uh, as tested, is really appreciation of form and structure when there is no content that is relevant to the individual in question. This is exactly the kind of performance that middle class white kids who are the intellectual descendants of Plato are trained on from the start. This very peculiar interest in structural relationships among things where content is irrelevant and need have no relevance to somebody's life is a cultural peculiarity of one particular cultural tradition. And so things like the Raven's progressive matrices and all tests that emphasize abstract appreciation of spatial relations and one thing and other, various kinds of abstraction, where the content is immaterial, are, will always have uh, Western educated, highly Western educated people coming out on top. That is not a culture free test. It is a test that selects for those abilities which are a particular cultural focus of one particular uh, tradition of one particular culture. Thank you. And in calling on the next speakers, I'd like to stress that it is not necessary to make your own statement, but you may want to direct questions to the panel. This is Dr. Blauner in sociology. My comments are in the form of a uh, rhetorical question, which I would, alike, I would like to allow time for uh, Dr. Jensen to respond to. Now, in, in Dr. Jensen's article, uh, you do accept the reality of systematic racial discrimination in the society. So I ask whether you think it is possible that the testing situation is perceived by black children as a critical point of contact between themselves and a hostile uh, or oppressive, if you will, society and that such an orientation, whether conscious or unconscious or partly both, to the testing situation might not profoundly affect uh, test performance. What I'm hypothesizing is that the fear, the anxiety, and the hostility toward a hostile environment may well be uh, sort of collected together, crystallized in the test situation. Uh, whether or not the children are put at ease uh, but through special methods, and whether or not the tests are administered by uh, black uh, testers or white testers because I'm suggesting that the young people know at a fairly early age that this test, the tests in general, play a rather crucial role in a process by which 
poor people, particularly uh, black people, are uh, concentrated in the bottom rungs of the society. First in the bottom uh, grades or, or, or levels, or what do we call them? Uh, uh, hmm? Tracks of the school system where these still exist. And then uh, later uh, in the occupational structure. So what I'm suggesting, and I'd like you to comment, is that our whole discussion today has left out basically left out, uh, Dr. Letterberg did mention alienation, but the oppressive nature of society, American society for black people, the key role that tests play in maintaining uh, or continuing that system of stratification or oppression. And thirdly, we don't really know how much these two factors affect test performance. Uh, one of the reasons I'm not uh, very impressed by that particular line of reasoning is the fact that we do find uh, differences on different tests. There are tests that we have on which uh, black children do as well as white children. And it seems to me if their lower performance on IQ tests or on tests of abstract reasoning were strictly the result of, a, um, of alienation or some general motivational disposition, that it should uh, show up uh, over a, a whole variety of tests. And it, uh, in fact, does not. Uh, one of the tests that we uh, have used in the Berkeley schools is a test that gets at the child's willingness to uh, follow the teacher's instructions and to marshal his uh, effort and attention for a short period of time in carrying out a task, which has no real cognitive loading beyond about second or third grade. That it is not an intelligence test. Uh, Negro and white children perform equally well on this test. We do find that on this test, Oriental children perform significantly better than the other two major uh, racial groups. Um, so it's, it's for reasons of that nature that I uh, do not believe you can explain all of the differences in motivational or test-taking attitude uh, terms. Any other comments? Anybody else? Well, I think the uh, question of alienation applies much more broadly than at the time of the test. It applies throughout the whole life and development and education of the child. Uh, his willingness to prepare himself for the test, in a sense, is, seems to me an, at least as important an issue as the test itself. Yes, I Next one is Dr. Gregor. Oh, uh, did you want to say anything? The next one, then, on my list is Dr. Gregor from Political Science. <coughs> I think the most, uh, perhaps the most interesting thing about discussions of this type, at least as far as I'm concerned, is uh, the character that the discussion generally takes. Uh, by and large, the discussion turns on issues, for example, that are omnibus issues, issues that can't be resolved very simply by any direct experimental examination of uh, the problems at hand. And we generally escape or take refuge into very broad surmise and very broad generalizations. And I think it's rather curious, for example, that uh, Professor Stinchcomb, who was very much concerned about measurement error and so forth, would use as an illustration of the increment in performance between draftees in World War I and World War II as evidence of a, of a kind of environmental hypothesis. One, because the point that uh, Professor Jensen makes, that is that the alpha test highly loads on academic, years of academic uh, instruction. But secondly, we have absolutely no evidence that the populations in the draft, the draftees at World War I are represented of the total population or that the techniques for the selection of draftees in World War I at all compares with the selection of draftees in World War II. Now, for a person terribly concerned about errors in measurement and sampling, this threat to internal validity in, in any kind of non-experimental design would clearly indicate that this would hardly be instructive as an illustration of increments in performance as a consequence of exposure to enriched environmental circumstances. Now, secondly, it seems to me that the refuge that we generally take in terms of alienation is, again, uh, a device for uh, indicating that this is a terribly complex problem. And I think that's perfectly true. Uh, the notion of alienation is very, very difficult to define, as you all know. Uh, there are at least six or eight standard definitions of alienation in the literature, both sociological and political science literature. I would suggest that there is a problem insofar as the interpretation of the depressant effect of the environment is operative in this particular situation. One has already been referred to by Professor Jensen. In my own studies of heritability, for example, we have found differential performances, for example, of Negroes and whites on the same sorts of tests. In some tests, for example, which involve certain kinds of cognitive skills, Negroes do not underperform. In other kinds of tests, they do underperform, which means that any general or omnibus notion of alienation 
would have to have some auxiliary hypothesis to explain the differential performance on these tests. Secondly, the fact that uh, was mentioned to by, uh, was referred to by Professor Stinchcomb, which he did not elaborate on, the fact that the Indian population, by whatever indices we have of alienation, that is, suicide rates, uh, lack of uh, identity with the school community, uh, language impairments, uh, educational levels of parents, um, economic stability, uh, lack of family intactness, and so forth. The Indians perhaps have a relative alienation level or disadvantage level of a magnitude at least comparable to that between Negroes and whites. And yet, Indian performance is markedly superior in any kind of test device that we employ that is, their performance is less than half standard deviation from the norms established for the standard uh, white population. Now, it seems to me that these incongruities or anomalies would have to be explained if we're going to take refuge in a kind of broad and, and very omnibus notion of alienation or oppression or what have you. And it seems to me that these are the kinds of issues we want to address ourselves to. They're terribly complicated. But it seems to me that we'd have to focus our attention on this in an objective and dispassionate manner if we're going to address ourselves to the serious issues and I think in general to the whole issue, very, very urgent issue of providing adequate education for all, which is a, is a subject that's too broad uh, for any, any um, stenographic uh, reference at this particular point. Thank you. Anyone would like to comment on these comments? Mm. Okay. Them in the audience. Dr. Tottenham, you want to comment? You, you will have the, uh, the stage later independently. Then you pass on. Then might I comment on Please, Dr. Dr. Tudman's research and the related research. The challenge has been made that the alpha data are not representative, and Dr. Tudnam can speak uh, for his own study. But um, this idea of a generation change uh, in tested ability is supported by a remarkable number of studies. Uh, the Scottish survey does seem not to consist with these others, but Nancy Bailey's work uh, the work of Shea and Struther at the University of Washington uh, have both shown clearly a rise in mental ability during adulthood, which contrasts very markedly with cross-sectional studies. No matter how carefully you sample, 40-year-olds seem to be poorer than 30-year-olds in the same decade. And this sampling now has been extended away from the educational matters specifically. But remember, the ground rules are that Professor Jensen has defined mental ability as what our tests are measuring. And on that basis, he can scarcely back away from Army Alpha. Even so, now we have it for spatial ability, and we have it for abstract reasoning ability. And the behavior of those curves is exactly the same, generation to generation, as for verbal and number. Now, I'm not prepared to explain the anomaly as to why some studies are giving us one reading and some another, but we are not linked to one single mental test and one single sampling procedure. May I just make one comment in regard to the Scottish survey, why the difference between 1932 and 47 is very small. It was still significant statistically, so I think it falls into the group of such studies. I was uh, provoked by the comment about uh, many definitions of alienation with which I certainly agree. I think it might be a very specific challenge to try to discover an instrument that will in fact reflect quantitatively in uh, one's common sense impression that there really is a difference in the expectations of an Indian and of a black child in American society. We come to the next uh, panel, uh, to the next discussion, Jack King, geneticist at the Donner Laboratory. I'm working both in quantitative genetics and molecular genetics, and I would like to agree with Dr. Lederberg that molecular genetics is very exciting. However, quantitative genetics is not dead. Uh, to my knowledge, the only really comprehensive and theoretically rigorous statement of how you determine heritability from twin data was not available until 1967, an article in the Proceedings in the National Academy of Science by Dr. Jensen. Again, uh, Dr. Jensen may be a newcomer to genetics, but he is hardly an amateur in this field. With respect to the, uh, uh, strictly the discipline of quantitative genetics, 
I would like to point out that the first questioner here was completely wrong as to how you partition variants uh, into genetic and non-genetic components. First you establish the genetic rigorously and then everything left over is environmental, so-called. Well, most, most of us used to thinking of environment in terms of income or cultural environment, other measurable types of environment as mentioned. However, the 20% environmental variance that uh, has been measured includes these things and in as well a lot of random stochastic variants, variants uh, just in the development of the organism. As a biologist, I'm aware that much of the variation between individuals, which is called environmental variance, is a chance uh, developmental thing, and that the 20% is a, does not represent the kind of variance that you find be, uh, in society, in the, uh, does not re represent the kind of environmental changes one usually thinks of as environment. Dr. Stenchcomb seemed surprised that within family variance was as great as between family uh, variance. I'd like uh, Dr. Uh, Jensen to clarify that issue if he could. Uh, the, the issue of the uh, within family variance being smaller than the between family variance. Well, uh, the, uh, the issue well, of the, the non-systematic uh, uh, component of so-called environmental variance. Uh, right. Uh, well, most of the studies show that the within family uh, variance is smaller than the between family variance. Um, uh, large, both because the uh, genetic differences between members of the same family are smaller than those between or among different families and because the environmental uh, the range of variation is smaller. Uh, the, um, uh, where you have complete uh, random mating, the genetic variance is equally di uh, distributed between, between families and uh, within families. Whereas when you have a sorted of mating, that is like marrying like, you decrease the variance within families, that is among siblings, and increase the uh, variance between uh, families. Now, is that the... Well, I, I, I guess I was thinking more in terms of... Uh, quantitative uh, estimates. Quantitative, uh, that, that much of the, the 20% is, does not oh, represent controllable variance. That's right. I think the, uh, the part that probably controllable is uh, something in the neighborhood of uh, half that. Much of it is, is... Yes, much is of it is just unaccounted The kind of variance you find between identical twins even within the same family. Right, yes. And these are probably uh, environmental effects uh, attributable to um, within family differences and prenatal differences, especially with, in the case of identical twins, we know that they don't get uh, uh, the same share of the prenatal environment. One more very quick question. How well do Negro children of average IQ do in school and in life? Again, Dr. Uh, I can't give any uh, flat answer to that. Um, in school, uh, the IQ test, again, predicts scholastic performance uh, about equally for Negroes and for whites. That is, for a given level of IQ, you get a certain a given level of uh, scholastic performance, and the same is uh, true in college. Uh, Otis Dudley Duncan has tried to make an estimate of the, so to speak, cost of being a Negro in our society by uh, predicting uh, income from IQ, scholastic performance, number of years of schooling, uh, family background, occupation of father, and a whole host of uh, environmental variables. He finds that when this is done, that the Negro still falls short some eight or nine hundred dollars per year when equated on all of the variables that he has been able to equate on. So that may be a partial answer. What is it for sure. women? It's less for women. Negro women, interestingly enough, um, are on a par with white women in income, and they're on a par with white men for income in the studies I've seen. Uh, there is a half a standard deviation difference between the IQs of Negro men and Negro women. The reason for this is not known. Um, there are hypotheses about it. It's something worth investigating. Twice as many Negro girls are capable of college work as boys. Uh, 
I think this needs research, and I think it's a socially important question, and it's something I am researching in my own uh, work. Dr. John Hurst from Education. Perhaps I might be considered as one of the alienated, which leaves me the uncomfortable position of raising what I think is the most serious question of all in this particular study. I do not feel that the social sciences are value-free, and however painful it may be, I think we must look at Dr. Jensen's work in this light. I think that his paper reflects a systematic bias, which indeed may be a summary of the comments this morning, which is a function of his own particular social-political orientation. I have documented this bias in a 130-page paper, which will appear, I hope, in the Harvard Educational Review this summer. And hence, on these grounds, not on scientific grounds, I feel it is a very poor paper indeed. For example, the best prediction of whether or not a scientist will take predominantly a genetic or environmental interpretation of the nature-nurture controversy is not their data, it is not their particular scientific discipline, but rather their social political orientation. This has been documented in studies by Pastore, studies by Sherwood and Altafi, and others. Let me mention just a few of the major sources of this particular bias. There are several major hypotheses that are implicit in this paper. In almost every case, there is an alternative hypothesis that fits the data equally as well, if not better. In almost every case, Dr. Jensen has given small attention, as has been noted this morning, to various alternative hypotheses. For example, the hypothesis of whether or not general intelligence is an adequate hypothesis to account for the intellect, or whether or not a multidimensional hypothesis is relevant. For example, the question of whether or not IQ is indeed a measure of an attribute of the organism, or more simply, a socially conditioned behavioral index, which would give rise to the data that has been presented. Therefore, to talk of the heritability of a socially conditioned index seems to me at best confusing. Now, let me exemplify that point because it hasn't been brought up at all. Uh, the idea that IQ is a measure of abstract reasoning ability is a little bit erroneous, I think. Uh, if you look at the general intelligence test, you'll find that much of the questions deal with memory, many of the questions deal with spatial perception, many of the questions deal with simply verbal information. So the notion itself, I think, is slightly in error. And I think if we are interested in measuring heritability, we bloody well better find some measures of attributes and not simply socially conditioned measures. Uh, if anybody wants to comment, I'll stop now, otherwise I could make a few more points. I should say that our time is very limited and we have three more individuals. So I would be grateful if you would terminate and if the next three speakers would keep this in three minutes. The next speaker would be Professor Cavalli Sforza, who is normally at the University of Pavia, but is at present visiting professor at Stanford, a geneticist. I would like to emphasize one fallacy that hasn't been sufficiently emphasized, I feel. And that is that uh, most of the research in uh, this subject is bound to uh, follow the uh, methods which have been devised with entirely different purposes uh, in, uh, by breeders. Now, breeders had very specific aims in mind. They wanted to improve their stock, and uh, they could do so. They had artificial selection, not only so, but uh, they could also equalize the environment and test the genotype accurately, and they could have pure lines and so on. Now, when these methods are brought over to human genetics, where none of this is in existence, one cannot equalize the environment, one cannot uh, uh, do selection experiments, fortunately, I, I think, and uh, one cannot uh, have pure lines, especially. I think the uh, uh, method is much more limited in scope, and one should not demand too much uh, of it. And uh, in particular, I think the heritability uh, measurement is an extremely poor yardstick and uh, one should always remember what uh, its limitations are. It's uh, the only, the best thing one can do, one can say about heritability is that it is better than nothing. And uh, that is the situation where we are now. I think uh, we uh, will be in the future able to know much more, but the approach should change. 
the approach uh, through uh, uh, the study of a character due to very many genes in a highly variable environment and uh, very poorly known, I think is an extremely uh, difficult job and uh, one should not uh, uh, place too many hopes. I think the best hope is in trying to find, to uh, use genetic analysis where, uh, in the way in which we know it has been useful in the past by looking at single gene differences which so far or which so far we know much too little to say nothing and uh, when this will be done, when this will be possible, we will be able to learn in a much safer way that is, will therefore also be less controversial than it can be at present. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, I would just make a comment on Professor Hurst's paper and that is that I think bringing my political affiliations or views into the issue is a, a pure form of ad hominem criticism. Uh, Hearst doesn't know what my political views are. I'm not sure that I do myself. Um, and then the other point is that the, you can measure the heritability of anything you want to measure the heritability of. Anything you can measure about a person will permit a heritability measurement by the usual techniques. Heritability is neutral with respect to the measurements. If there is no heritability of the thing that's being measured, it'll show up in a very low heritability value, a value of zero if there's no heritability at all. So to, um, to claim that uh, intelligence is a socially conditioned trait and therefore uh, should not be heritable is uh, obviously contradicted by the fact that the heritability estimates are quite high for measured intelligence. Okay. Thank you. Uh, May I make just a brief comment that the twin study method, which unfortunately is about all that we have, is an extremely feeble instrument for the investigation of the genetic bases of, of any trait. It says absolutely nothing about whether one or five million genes is involved. It might be better to describe the consequences as congenital variants rather than genetic variants because there is certainly a confounding between the common heredity of two monozygous twins and the fact that they have uh, been nurtured through a common pregnancy. The more we learn about the impact of early virus infections and about the early nutritional state of the mother, the more real these apparently quibbling kinds of qualifications uh, do appear. Uh, I just don't find it a particularly useful instrument for answering any important questions. Of course, the twin uh, <coughs> method is not the only uh, type of data from which one can obtain heritability estimates. And uh, I, I agree with... Um, uh, Professor James Crow, a quantitative geneticist, that one of the impressive things about heritability estimates is the uh, considerable agreement among heritability estimates obtained from different types of kinship relationships. Um, they all add up to a very uh, consistent picture, as I point out in my paper. May I turn to Dr. Tottingham now? <coughs> Professor of Psychology. There's really not time left on the tape for me to make the comments that I had intended to offer, and besides, Professor Greger of Political Science has anticipated me and said them. So let me only uh, point out an historical parallel. It's interesting to me that although Professor Jensen and Professor Kronbach pointed out that our central concern should be discovering how best to teach people with different patterns of ability, the discussion has immediately become polarized upon the issue of race differences, essentially white differences versus black, uh, whites versus blacks. Uh, in the first two or three decades of this century, uh, a rather similar thing happened. Then, as now, uh, geneticists presented data and environmentalists explained it away. But in this case, it had to do with sex differences. Uh, after the 19th Amendment was passed, women acquired the vote, and the status of women was no longer such a central social issue. Uh, it became possible to do adequate research on sex differences. And we are now discovering very interesting sex differences in cognitive abilities, which undoubtedly have a genetic basis but it would be, have been very difficult to do adequate research on this earlier. Uh, I think we may be in a little bit that position now. If we can all work to uh, more nearly equalize educational opportunity for young people in our society of whatever color, uh, I like to think that in another decade or two it will be possible to study fruitfully race differences, which I am convinced exist. Thank you, Dr. Tottingham. Any comment? Then the last uh, uh, Questioner is Dr. Bill Laufmann, geneticist at the Donner Laboratory. I have 
two fairly simple questions stemming <clears throat> from my understanding of comments by earlier comments by Dr. Letterberg. I think they are sufficiently closely related to permit possibly a single simple answer. It's directed to the entire panel, but specifically to the geneticists on the panel. There has been a widespread feeling that research like Dr. Jensen's should be stopped. Speaking as geneticists with a concern for the quality of human life, do you believe that Dr. Jensen has raised issues important enough in their implications for society to demand further investigation? And would you encourage efforts by educators and geneticists to investigate these issues? I think I'd already given my answer to that question, but I had rather definite specifications of what I thought fruitful lines of genetic research were, namely the search for particular genes and their de developmental impact. And I also indicated what I regarded as the futility of the uh, global population studies involving very disparate genotypes embedded in very variable environments. I suppose I should react to that a little. First, uh, seconding Dr. Letterberg's statement earlier that if you're going to get data, you don't want a little data, you want a lot, and the more you have, the more confidence you get in it. Uh, and I would hope to, rather than start an adversary proceedings between us, I would ask for a marriage that uh, the history of population genetics in, in much less sensitive areas has been to make use of the information that molecular biology and molecular genetics is developing. I think ultimately the population is where the gene lives and that's where we have to take it back and find out not only in a very practical standpoint what we can do for the populations but uh, what still remains interesting to me in an academic standpoint, how are those populations put together? And I think that has to be a population study. I fully agree with that aspect of it, but I would contrast the fruitfulness of studies on the factors that uh, concern, for example, the, the incidence of the gene for sickle hemoglobin in the population with the ones that we've got here. I mean, such population studies do give us concrete answers about important problems, and I just uh, don't see uh, anything but a blind alley for the kind of work that's been the major part of discussion today. Dr. Kornberg, would you like to say something? Well. As an educator, I do not have much enthusiasm for the genetics research, but I certainly think it is important uh, to our knowledge of man. As an educator, I have to ask a slightly different question. It's this interaction question that we haven't really gotten on the table properly. How can you teach different kinds of people? But if we're going to teach a six-year-old, we're interested in the six-year-old as he is today phenotypically, and for the educator, the genetic game isn't very relevant. Uh, Dr. Stinchcom, would you like to see? I'd like to point out again that the problems of the developmental acquisition of language or communicative competence is ignored, I think, in all of Professor Jensen's work as far as the more recent developments. And I include even the Harvard Education Review paper. And I feel that, that you cannot ignore this work if you want to talk about tests and their relevance, how you test and what you test, and how you assess what a child can produce and understand. The notion of environment and, and uh, genetic influence seems to me is gleaned from information based on these tests. And these tests have to be questioned, and it seems to me you, you cannot treat them as some kind of facts because I've tried to indicate that the very way in which these facts are produced are subject to question on any number of grounds that simply have not been investigated. You cannot talk about what that child understands by assuming you have a standardized test what I'm pointing out is we have to learn something about how that child thinks and communicates and encodes what he thinks in the messages. And I'm saying that present evidence indicates that we know nothing about that. And what we do know seriously questions the conclusions that are now being drawn from these IQ tests. Dr. Jensen. <clears throat> um, even if we did not know what the IQ tests were measuring in terms of specific psychological processes, uh, the fact that we have heritability estimates on them that no one has seriously questioned uh, indicates that they are uh, conditioned in large part by genetic factors. We can obtain measurements, call them X, do heritability studies on those measurements, and if the heritability, average heritability comes out in the neighborhood that it does for intelligence tests, we could make some statement about the fact that these measurements have some biological uh, basis, variance in the measurements have some biological basis, it seems to me. And uh, part of the task of psychological research is to uh, describe the 
uh, psychological processes that go into performance on various kinds of tests. We have not solved our problem. We didn't expect it to be solved. We are all concerned. All of us agree that we should learn more. I think there is a definite positive relevance of what Dr. Jensen and other people have discussed in that it applies immediately to educational procedures as they develop and as they will be changed in the future. I think we have been sitting around here with very serious faces and this is justified because we are climbing a difficult cliff. It is dangerous, but I think we might smile a little bit too and hope that we will rise to the top. Let us be optimists. Thank you.